All right, looks like we got a pretty full crowd and a few minutes past, so let's jump in, everyone. Uh, well, good morning and, and welcome to the uh, September 2021 Kansas City IA chapter meeting. Uh, this is the first meeting of the 2021-22 program year, so thanks for joining us. Thanks, members and su subscribers for following us. Um, today, I want to introduce to you Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Um, Dr. Gleb's going to be talking to us uh, you know, concepts around back to office post pandemic, uh, a lot of concepts within that for the next few hours. And he's kind of uh, catered it towards our industry, our practice, um, admitting people as I speak here, our industry and our practice. Uh, so hopefully some good takeaways from that. So let me introduce to you uh, Dr. Gleb, who is a globally recognized thought leader in future proofing and cognitive bias risk management. Dr. Webb serves as CEO of the Future Proofing Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Experts, uh, and this group helps clients avoid dangerous threats and missed opportunities. Dr. Webb is a best-selling author of seven books, uh, and as you saw, some of those books were, were referenced in the registration invite. Uh, he's especially known for the 2019 seller, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. Um, he's there's also another more recent book um, that is on the topic of today that uh, has been shared with the group as well. Um, he's published over four, 550 articles and gave over 450 interviews for prominent venues like Fortune, US Today, and Times. And I'm sure you saw that he was published in, in other publications as well. His internationally renowned thought leadership was uh, translated into Chinese, Russian, and Korean and other languages as well. Uh, Dr. Webb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, and training. His clients include innovative startups, major nonprofits, Fortune 500 companies, anywhere from Aflac to, to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his research uh, background as a behavioral scientist with 15 years in academia. Uh, so that includes seven years as a professor at Ohio State University for any, any Buckeyes out there and, um, and had lots of uh, peer reviewed articles produced at that time. So in his free time, uh, Dr. Webb makes sure to spend a lot of quality time with his wife uh, to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. Um, at, at the end of the day, that's the name of the game. So with that said, uh, I'll turn things over to Dr. Webb. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Philip. All right, everyone. So let's talk about how you, as internal auditors, can address returning to the office and leading hybrid and remote teams. And by the way, I'm talking to internal auditors at all sorts of venues, from large, medium-sized corporations to nonprofits, to municipalities, governments, all sorts of internal auditing teams need to be part of making this decision. And you as internal auditors have some more flexibility than other folks who are essential in being in the workplace. So that's kind of one benefit for you that you have more flexibility, but you also in your auditing, there are some things that benefit from being in the office. So you have to negotiate these sorts of things, especially your collaboration with other teams outside of internal auditing. So there are some particularities about internal auditing that we'll get into in the discussions on this topic. Now, let's talk about more broadly, the kind of things that we have to think about in terms of returning to the office, leading hybrid and remote teams in this really challenging environment with the Delta surge and kicking our butts and all of these other problems while people are still vaccinated, boosters coming, what's going on with returning to the office? How should we think about this topic and how should we think about leading hybrid and remote teams as part of the returning to the office decision-making process? Now, You've probably heard a lot of leaders say that people are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. And this is kind of a challenging statement in terms of returning to the office because it often leaders' desires go against what people, <laughs> the greatest resource, want to do. And many leaders do fail to live by that principle, as we see from so many leaders making some pretty problematic decisions on returning to the office. I mean, and we're talking about not simply kind of local, smaller organizations. We're talking about the largest companies. So look what happened with Google as an example. Google was talking for months about how it will return everyone back to the office. Everyone will come back to the office, back to their original office, you know, maybe coming in as a hybrid team, but back to the hybrid schedule, but back to the office. I was talking about that for months. 
for the throughout the pandemic. And my internal sources at Google were telling that it, as they found that they were able to do fine their work out at home, that many people at Google really didn't want to return back to the office. They could see, inter including internal auditors, and they could see that they could do their work very well from home. And so that caused a lot of tension and struggle within Google and good people started leaving increasingly. There was disengagement as opposed to employee engagement, disengagement, lack lower morale. And so Google eventually had to turn that around. And on May 5th said that, you know, we screwed up, we made a mistake, we're gonna change our policy. So we're gonna have a permanent post pandemic shift where we'll have 20% of our workforce fully remote another 20% working from any office as opposed to their original office, which they previously said you have to go back to your original office, didn't accommodate the very well the very many people who moved during the pandemic. So Google screwed up and it cost them many, many billions of dollars with top talent leaving, we have to replace. Then of course, employee disengagement, low morale, problems there and changes in returning to the office. They had to really, they were remaking their office. They were doing things. They were investing in the office. And now they're going to have 20% of their people remote. I mean, that's, it's a lot of wasted, wasted money. It's funnily enough, same thing happened to Amazon. Amazon was saying, we're going to have to go back to the office, everyone back to the office. And they started losing people, getting employee disengagement, lower morale, and then on June 10th, they changed their tunes. So and this is all, by the way, before the Delta search. So this is before the Delta search. They are realizing that they made a real screw up even before the Delta search. So that changed on June 24th. Uber changed the same thing, changed its policy on June 24th. And then that got, now we're getting into the, and Apple was having similar tensions and struggles. and. It, didn't change its policy, but it really had a lot of people leaving also struggle. So we see that even the top companies, the biggest companies, you know, even technology companies we're talking about really are screwing up. I mean, these are trillion dollar companies, not Uber, but you know, the others, uh, but Uber is pretty huge as well. So we're seeing very, very bad decision-making at the very top levels and bad decision-making in, in relation to the Delta surge. We'll talk about those examples a little bit deeper into the program, but we can see the bad decision-making from the fact that leaders were saying one thing, and then they found that they were making mistakes and saying this, they found lots of employee position, and then they reversed their policies because they screwed up. And these are top, top level leaders. And we're seeing this, of course, throughout many, many smaller companies and municipalities and nonprofits that aren't household names. So we're seeing bad mistakes by the leadership where leaders are failing to live by the principle of people being our greatest resource because they're comfortable with in-office culture. They like that, they prefer that. We'll talk about why a little bit later, but you have to understand that leaders generally compared to the staff have much more of a preference for in-office culture, spending as much time in the office as possible. And there's some serious issues around that with the tensions. They want to turn back the clock. Leaders are looking to turn back the clock to January 2020. Unfortunately, that denies the reality of the major disruption of the pandemic, the year and a half where people found that you know they can do lots and even com perhaps completely all of their work from home. They don't have to go back to the office and they really hate the commute. That's a top complaint from, from surveys of people who are asked about why do you want to go back to the office? Do you not want to go back to the office? And so that is a serious issue, kind of this commute issue. And there are other issues that are going on, but leaders deny the reality of this major disruption and they want to turn back the clock. We're seeing this over and over. Many, many leaders are making the same sort of mistake. And I'm curious, have you observed this happen in your context? I'm not saying necessarily in your company or your municipality or nonprofit, or wherever you work, but have you seen leaders around you, not necessarily in your organization, but in other organizations, perhaps trying to turn back the clock? So you will see, uh, you will see a poll now. So you should be able to see a Zoom poll and you should be able to vote on whether you saw leaders trying to turn back the clock. So please go ahead and vote in that Zoom poll. I see about 
nearly 90% participated. I'll give you five more seconds if you didn't make your voice heard yet. All right, so as you can see, the vast majority of you have seen leaders trying to turn back the clock. And this is a problem that leaders aren't realizing the impact of this major disruption, the 18 months, they're trying to turn back the clock to this time before the pandemic, sort of as though as nothing happened and that's not realistic. And we're seeing that the largest companies are making these same sorts of mistakes and they're screwing up and all sorts of other organizations are making these mistakes as well. So let's talk about what is going on here. Now, we need to think about the return to the office, not in the way that most leaders are thinking about it. And so here's, I mean, you've seen my book, so returning to the office and leading hybrid and remote teams, benchmarking to best practices for competitive advantage. This was something that Kansas IAA secured for all of you. And if you've seen that book, you know that I've worked with 12 companies by now, 12 organizations by the time I wrote the book in the, whatever it was, May, June, May, June. By now I've worked with 16 companies, including a number of Fortune 500 companies, as well as smaller companies and a few, couple of nonprofits and municipalities on returning back to the office. And so I have a lot of experience in this and I've also done a lot of research on the behavioral science of returning back to the office. What does it mean? What are the, all the other contexts? looking at comparative examples in order to infer, inform the best practices that I help organizations benchmark to, and we're gonna be talking about here. One of the biggest problems I see with leaders with this return to the office, again, they're trying to return back to past practices and they're seeing the return to the office as just such a huge pain point, just a big, big source of struggle and challenge. They're seeing this as a big, big issue that is not, allowing them to see the reality of the situation. This is actually a major opportunity, a major opportunity to really rethink the way, you know, you don't let a, such a crisis go to waste, as people say, right? Don't let a crisis go to waste. This is a major opportunity to rethink the future of work for yourself, for your team, for everyone around you, in order to maximize productivity and engagement and use best practices. You know, it's really hard to change when you have people going, you know, returning, when you have, when you're returning to the, when you're working in the office and when you have all of these habits and norms and ways that you interact together, it's really hard to change that <laughs> naturally because you have to, you know, fix the plane while it's flying. That's, that's hard to do. But now we have a wonderful, wonderful opportunity and leaders aren't seeing this as an opportunity. It's a really wonderful opportunity to rethink all aspects of the way that we engage in the office, working remotely, doing hybrid. This is a wonderful opportunity. And it's pretty silly that leaders aren't really thinking about this as an opportunity, that they're seeing this as a pain point. You need to be thinking about this and help the leaders in your organizations to the extent that you're a leader and to the extent that you're influencing leaders, you need to help them realize this is a wonderful opportunity to maximize productivity, engagement, recruitment, retention, morale. This is really a wonderful opportunity to do so. Or doing that requires putting aside these default assumptions we have about how to work together, our default habits, our default preferences, even though it might feel uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, this is really important to, it's really important to focus on our business objectives and our outcomes. What do we actually want to accomplish? We want to maximize productivity, engagement, morale. We want to maximize recruitment and retention. We want to maximize people's well-being. So we want to focus on all of this and that all feeds into the company's bottom line, of course. Now that means that we need to put aside all of those defaults that we have and all of those things that make us feel comfortable because defaults make us feel comfortable, but that feeling of comfort may not be indicative at all of the best things that we should be doing for the sake of business objectives. So that's what we need to be thinking about. You want to overcome decision-making cognitive biases on the future of work. We'll talk about what those are, but these cognitive biases are driving us to make some pretty bad decisions on the future of work. I need to, we need to overcome them. And we'll talk also on how to integrate best practices on innovative work arrangements in the future of work. So that's gonna be more of the 
latter half of the presentation, we'll be talking about how do you actually work effectively in this future of work? How do you collaborate effectively in hybrid settings, in virtual settings? What does all of that mean? But the first part of the presentation will be about these information about these dangerous judgment errors, the kind of errors that we make and how do we address these errors. So that's the structure of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate, just so that you're looking forward to it and that you know what's coming. So the first thing I want to highlight, and this is really important for everyone to realize, the returning to full-time office work is not a good idea. For I mean, everyone except, non -ess uh, except essential workers, I mean, the essential workers never left, right? Pretty much everyone who left the office during the pandemic, which is about half of the workforce and includes pretty much all internal auditors who were able to, your job overwhelmingly doesn't require being in the office. There are some aspects of your job, which in some cases may be better done in the office, depending on what you're doing, how you're interacting with people. And we'll talk about that in the second half of the presentation, but your job does not depend on being in the office overwhelmingly so. And that's why the vast majority of internal auditors were able to go home during the lockdowns and they were able to work pretty successfully during the lockdowns. So returning to the full-time office work for pretty much the 50% of the American workforce who were able to work from home during the pandemic, during the throes of the pandemic, you know, during the before the vaccines is really bad. We have a lot of research showing that it's very bad for many, many things, for retention of your workforce, for recruitment of new folks, for morale of your existing workforce, for productivity of your existing workforce and morale engagement, work-life balance, that's pretty bad for that perspective. Mental health and well-being is also pretty seriously damaged. And the bottom line, the bottom line of your organization, whether it's a company that looks at profits, whether it's nonprofit municipality that looks at mission, it's really bad. <laughs> so you don't want that. So this is why returning to office full-time is pretty bad and full-time, you know, four or five days a week, that, that's not good. That is going to be forcing people. Of course, some people want to do that, and that's great, you know, let them do it. But forcing people to do it is a bad idea. Let's talk about what the data says, what the major internal surveys say. And so these are major independent surveys by large organizations. I'm talking about organizations like the Harvard Business School, doesn't have a stake in the outcome. By the Society of Human Resources, doesn't have a stake in the outcome. Really, really human resource management, doesn't have a stake in the outcome. Huge organizations, very credible. And this is what, this is what the surveys are saying about returning to the office. 75 to 85% of workers from the various surveys, depending on the survey and the way the question is asked, want substantial remote work. And this is, by the way, where surveys done already after it was pretty clear that we were all going to get highly effective vaccines. So it, that's the situation. 75% to 85% of workers want substantial remote work. That means at least half the time working remotely. And 25 to 35%, depending on the survey, want full-time remote work. That is important to consider. 45, 40 to 55% would leave their job if they weren't given that their options, if they were forced to come in full-time. That's bad for retention and recruitment, obviously. And we're seeing people leaving, including from, like I said, Apple, from Amazon, from Google, from Uber, where we're seeing household name companies, but also much smaller companies and organizations with which I've worked, which have seen people leave when they weren't given their desired preferences of full-time remote work and other preferences. So this is a very serious issue. And this is something that we need to keep in mind and not treat it like, oh, people are just saying that they're gonna leave. You know, there's a reason this period for which we're living is called the great resignation. The great resignation, you've probably heard that term. That refers to the fact that many, many people have been kind of stuck at jobs that they may not necessarily enjoy that much during the pandemic. And they've also rethought, and partially because they've rethought during the pandemic, how they want to work. And they found, figured out that, hey, if I can do my job from home, why do I need to come back to the office? That, that's not great. So when they're seeing that companies are trying to force them to go back to the office, or when they're even seeing uncertainty, when a company is saying, well, maybe we'll 
get you to go back to the office or maybe you know maybe not we'll we'll see we'll see what the situation is with the pandemic with the delta surge people are looking for a full-time remote job i'm seeing plenty of people leave companies for a full-time remote job linkedin has increased its the the data from linkedin indicate that full-time remote positions have increased vastly something i think the latest figures i saw were like 500 percent increase it's huge increases in offerings of employees who are giving others a full-time job a full-time remote job there's a reason that people are leaving a lot of companies and I'm, right now and this is not by the way only at tech companies i know i mentioned tech companies but i'm working with a fortune 200 large manufacturing company where, of course, a number of employees have to be there in the office. And they did internal surveys. They found that of their internal surveys, something like 12% wanted to work full-time remotely, large majority wanted to work hybrid. And of course, they less than average wanted to work full-time remotely because this is a manufacturing company. So they found that and they were figuring, well, they, and they are a high-tech manufacturing company. They know that the people who can work full-time remotely can easily leave for a lot of companies that are offering them full-time remote work. So they decided that many business units within this company decided that, yes, we'll allow people to work full-time remotely, even though we're a manufacturing company and some people have to be on the workplace at all times because we don't want to lose this talent and we want to be competitive for talent. You know, they hired something like, just over 20% of their workforce during the pandemic because they were growing pretty quickly during the pandemic. It's a semiconductor manufacturing company. And so they were pretty successful. And so they did not, they were competing for talent. And it's, of course, especially now with the vaccines available, they're going to be growing even more quickly with the demand for manufacturing for semiconductors shooting through the roof. So they needed to have good recruitment and they knew that offering full-time remote work is a great way to do so. And 70%, talking about retention, over 70% said that they're less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work. So over 70% less likely to leave. Now, another dynamic that's important here is diversity inclusion, diversity, equity, inclusion. Now, an interesting survey was done on knowledge workers. So people who work with their knowledge, with their expertise, like auditors. 20% of white knowledge workers said that they want to work full-time in the office. So of all knowledge workers, 20% of those who are white want to work full-time back in the office. What about people who are not white? What about black people? How many of them want to work full-time back in the office? Only 3%, only 3%. So compared to 20% of white knowledge workers, only 3% of black knowledge workers. Why is that? because of microaggressions. So they face microaggressions and bias back in the office, and they know they have found during their full-time remote work that they can avoid these microaggressions as discrimination to a much larger extent. There's still some digital discrimination going on. We'll talk about dealing with that in the second half of the presentation, but this is something that you can really see very clearly is not nearly as much of an issue for in digital settings. So this is a similar finding for other minority groups where they overwhelmingly, in order to have good diversity inclusion, it's important to have full-time virtual options and to have substantial remote options for hybrid workforce. So if that really helps diversity inclusion in your organization. Now, another important factor is that working from home improves well-being. So we're looking at these surveys we see that substantial work from home after COVID is not a problem, that, that was the question, would make over 75% of the people happier, over 70% of the people less stressed, over 75% of the people better able to manage their work-life balance. So it's important for that factor to address burnout issues and all of those challenges. Also, we see that work from home just makes people more productive. It's very clear. You can very clearly see these statistics. On average, people worked over 20 hours more per month during work compared to when they worked in the office. Why is that? 
Well, because they didn't have to do the commute. I mean, the commute is essentially unpaid work and people didn't work during, they didn't work during that time during the commute. Maybe they thought about their workplace or made some calls, but they weren't really effect, efficiently and effectively working during the commute. And that's kind of, you know, 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back, that's an hour and a half per day. You know, that's seven and a half hours per week. That's a lot of time. And so this was sort of over a month that would be something like, you know, 25-ish hours. And so people who were working from home made up most of the time, 80% of the time, through work from home during the time that they would have been commuting. Over 75% of people report higher or equal productivity. So that's very clear. And employees, talking about productivity from the other end, they would take an average of 5 to 15% pay cut, 8% on average, for substantial remote work. And then, of course, people who want to have full-time remote work would take a larger pay cut on average than people who just want a little bit of remote work. It depends on their preferences, but we can see that. Overall, we see from various statistics averaged out, we know that working from home full-time means something like 10 to 14% increase in productivity on average for employees. So really good boost in productivity. Now, there are some challenges with remote work. So let's talk a little bit about this. Remote work causes people to feel overworked because remote work is generally not done effectively in terms of setting boundaries. So we'll talk about in the second half of the presentation about how to not overwork people and how to set appropriate boundaries. 55% of the people experience, more than 55% of the people experience burnout because of this lack of boundaries and poor expectations. Over 80% want fewer meetings, and that's definitely a good thing to have fewer meetings. The biggest issues that people find are poor virtual communication skills. I'm shocked by how few companies invest into virtual communication skills. This is a really important professional development area. And over 55% report technology issues as a serious issue. So this is what the statistics are. Now, I'll take another poll and I'll see which, what would be your preferred working style after the pandemic is not an issue. So please go ahead and vote. What would be your preferred working style after COVID just becomes endemic rather than a pandemic? I see that new, nearly 90% of you participated, so I'll give you five more seconds. Make your voice heard. Okay, good. So we see that this is pretty close to the average results for the statistics. Well, we have on the higher end of the internal auditors of you wanting to work fully remote, just coming in once a quarter for team building retreats, one to three days in the office, that's 31, that's 40% of you. And then more specifically, two, two days in the office, three days in the office. So the people who want to work full time, essentially four to five days in the office, that's less than 10%. So a little bit less than the average statistical survey saying. Good. Okay. Now, at this point, I'll take any questions on the first part. This is kind of the informational part on the statistics, surveys, sort of ways of thinking. The next part will be on cognitive biases. And then the next part will be on the best practices of how do you adapt to the future of work. But before we get to the dangerous judgment errors themselves and the best practices, I want to take any questions that you might have on information. We don't have questions, we'll go into groups and you will discuss these general surveys and how you find it compares to what you are doing and what people in your company want to see. But go ahead, questions, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself or you can ask them in the chat. Yeah, and if, you, if you'd like to be unmuted, I might have to, uh, to unmute you, so just... Okay, just, just use the chat then, it'll be easier, less hassle. Yeah, and, I, and I'm happy I to unmute as well, but I think you might just need to request it. Cool. Here we go, Jesse's got a question. Okay, yeah, and Tatiana Hansen sent me a separate question. Okay. So 
So I'll answer Tatiana Hansen's question. She asked, how is the productivity for working from home measured? There are a number of measurements. One was measurements from Microsoft Teams and Slack from their internal data, where they were, of course, able to track this data of how productive people were. So that was one, source of, one sort of measurement. Another sort of measurement was reporting from workers themselves and from their managers, so direct reports. So we have both measured data from quantitative data from Slack from Microsoft Teams, and we have reporting from, because that, that's able to capture some of the data, but other data from the quality of the work is captured from reporting from managers on the productivity of workers and reporting from workers themselves. Okay, second. How much of management ownership desire for a turn to the office is least real estate thinking based versus old school thinking based? There is a little bit of the lease real estate thinking based, but once they really think about it, this real lease real estate based, they realize that they'll save themselves much more costs in the long term by letting go of these lease if they own the office space by selling it, which you know tends to be the, some own many lease. So there's a lot of benefits to actually not returning to the office from the long term from lease real estate perspective. Other folks, any more questions? All right, good. So oh, one question from Lori. How's company culture and team camaraderie affected by remote work? So that depends on whether you do remote work well or not. So I'll talk in the second half. This is a good uh, question to for the second half of the presentation about how to do remote work work well. If you do remote work poorly, it's affected badly. So for example, Zoom happy hours. Zoom happy hours are not good according to the research. People do not enjoy them. It's not engaging for you know, managers generally have to force their team members to attend and they feel disengaged. And it's, it's, it's generally not a good thing. But because what happens is that team managers, they don't have, they just try to impose their old style ways of collaborating in the office on the remote work culture, they make serious mistakes about how to do remote work well. And so that is a serious problem. And we'll talk about how to do remote work best practices in the second half of the presentation. Okay, now what I'll do at this point, let's see. Um, Philip, can you make sure to give me co-host status so I can break up people into breakout groups? Yes, I think you are. So what if I just made you full host? Okay, try that. Just yeah. somehow not seeing the if option that's not, if that's not the solution it might be level of zoom that we have. it might be what might be this the the zoom product that we have here if you're not able to do that okay. so you're trying you're trying to do breakout rooms is that i am trying doing? to break out rooms right okay so give us a second for to see if we can resolve this technical issue and if not then we will go on <laughs> Well, the breakout rooms. So, need your co-host. Is it or full-on host? Is it? Uh... No, can't do it. Okay, we haven't tried it yet. Um, something we want to try in the future, but I'm not seeing any. Is it typically just a, an option down yeah. at the bar? Okay. Yep, it's typically an option. So it might have to do with uh, kind of the Zoom product. Nah. All right, no worries. Then we will not do the. Then we won't do the breakout groups. So you won't have an opportunity, unfortunately, to chat with each other. But yeah, such is life. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Cool. Let's go on to the cognitive biases. And these dangerous judgment lead errors that leaders are making and what's going on there. So the first decision-making cognitive bias on the future of work that I want to talk about is this being stuck in the past, status quo bias. So 
one of the questions mentioned old school thinking. This is what it, this relates to. The status quo bias is everyone's preference, our preference, your preference, my preference, to maintain or get back to the status quo, whatever we perceive as the status quo. That is what is comfortable for us. That's what feels good, to maintain the status quo. It's scary to go into uncertain situations. It's scary to adopt and go into new things. It feels uncomfortable. So that is a problem because leaders, they've spent their career 10, 20, 30 years being successful in, in office settings. And they feel that that's how they're successful. They feel that that's what guarantees their success. They tend to be extroverted. They tend to be gregarious. They tend to be like being surrounded by other people when they work. And they feel that that's the right thing. That is the status quo. That's what they want to get back to. They want to turn back the clock to January 2020. That is a tendency that I've seen in very many leaders. Of course, not all leaders, but very many leaders. So they downplay this major disruption from the pandemic. And this tends to be a very serious issue where they downplay this major disruption from the pandemic and they ignore what's going on. So what's happening on the other end? Well, from the perspective of workers, they have been successful from the last year and a half working from home and they've been comfortable, they've been successful at it. And so they changed their perspective on what the status quo is. For them, their previous status quo was disrupted. I mean, nobody would be you know, complaining about go, having to go back to the office if there was no pandemic and that, that wouldn't be a thing. But the pandemic has really changed people's perspectives, people's minds, people's perceptions on what's going on with what is the right thing to do, what is the right way to live, what is the right way to collaborate. And so that is a serious problem from a leadership perspective, that leaders are in tension with ordinary people on what's going on in terms of how to move forward with their attention with the rank and file employees, with the rank and file staff, with perceptions of what is the appropriate status quo, what is the normal status quo. So this is a serious issue that you need to address, that you need to figure out how to do, how to deal with and at your office, at your workplace. So I'll be, I'll take any questions about this topic right now on the status quo bias and hear what you have to say so that we understand this and go into this in depth. I'll also, since we can't have this kind of conversation with the group setting, let's have a conversation where people share about any status quo bias that they could observe in their office, kind of verbally out loud, that you can unmute yourself or you can share in the chat any situations that happened with the status quo bias that you noticed in your office. So I'll take questions and I would also like to hear from you about your experiences. So please go ahead and share and also ask me questions. Yeah, if, if you would, I think uh, you can just ask to unmute and I can enable that. Not seeing anybody yet. And also, Dr. Glove, I'm looking into the breakout option here. One of my committee members sent me a little guide instructions on that. Okay, good. That'll be good. Great. So Tara asks, how do you recommend having these discussions with management that doesn't seem open to listening? So I would recommend that you help your management realize that their intuitions may be leading them in the wrong direction. So you want to orient toward business objectives. Management generally, what people tend to do is they go with their gut, they follow their intuitions, they go with their heart. What are these cognitive biases, these dangerous judgment errors in the work in the first place? We need to understand what those are. What, why do I talk about doing things that are counterintuitive, that are uncomfortable? Now, our intuitions, our gut reactions, those things that leaders are told to go with, they're actually not wired for the modern environment. They're wired for the savannah environment. When we lived in small tribes 
of 50 people to 150 people when we had to rely on the fight or flight reflex. The fight or flight reflex is not a good situation, was a great situation for that ancient savannah environment when we had to jump at 100 shadows to get away from one saber-toothed tiger. You might have heard of this as the saber-toothed tiger response. So that's, that's something that was very good for the savannah environment. You know, if you didn't jump at 100 shadows in the savannah environment, you got eaten by the saber-toothed tiger, you wouldn't pass on your genes. So we are the descendants of all of those who had a very strong fight or flight response. That was great for them for that savanna environment that we're talking about there, but it's not great for the modern environment. So not a very good fit for the modern environment because we have many less saber-toothed tigers. You might've noticed that. <laughs> so that is something that we have to realize is different for the modern environment, but we still make our reactions. We still go with our intuitions. We still feel something is scary or something is good, and we go with those intuitions, that fight or flight response. Similarly, the tribalism aspect of things, that we had to be very tribal in that savanna environment. And that savanna environment tribalism, if we weren't sufficiently tribal, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die. So that was not great. And we had to be opposed to other tribes because if, not, if we weren't sufficiently opposed to them, they'd take us over and we'd die. That's not great either. So that's something that we had to deal with in the savanna environment. And that's not something we have to deal with in the modern environment, but we're still very tribal. We're still wired for the tribalism. So managers are feeling that, hey, the status quo bias and other cognitive biases are the consequences of this evolutionary heritage and also just the way that we're wired. Yeah, Philip, you had a question? I didn't. I, I just... No, I didn't. I was okay. typing back. I was typing back to uh, somebody in the chat here, though. There were some no other questions. Sorry. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll get to those questions in a minute. So what was hap What happens in the modern environment is that these cognitive biases, the status quo bias, and so on, are a consequence of our evolutionary heritage. So the status quo bias, naturally in the savanna environment, was very important for us to maintain the status quo because our survival was very dependent on things being as they are. If things shifted, it was generally bad for us. It was generally bad for the, our survival for them to shift. In the modern environment, things shift much more drastically and rapidly, whether with the 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis, whether with other sort of shifts, they shift quickly and that we need to adapt to a new situation, to a new environment. But that's not what our intuition tells us. So managers, who tend to not adapt nearly as quickly to new environments as they should. And so they tend to want to go back to the status quo. So we need to, when we are talking to managers about this, you need to help them realize that their intuitions may be at odds with what's good for the company, that they may not be realizing the full extent of this major disruption and that it's gonna be harmful for retention, recruitment, morale, engagement, productivity, well-being and so on, you need to present them with this data, with this external company data, with this external survey data for what's going on and say, look, I'm really concerned about these issues and what's going to happen with our organization in the future because the, we're sticking with our intuitions about what's the right thing to do as opposed to looking at the bottom line and objectively about what's really going to help our company. So that's kind of, I want to give that background of what's going on so that you don't think the managers are being stubborn. It's not about stubbornness and it's not, that's not what it's about. It's about their feeling. It's about their intuition. They're told by gurus like Tony Robbins to go with their gut and follow their heart and trust their intuition. You know, Tony Robbins tells you to be primal, be savage. That's terrible advice. You know, it's great to be primal and savage in the savannah environment. In the modern environment, you have to be the opposite of that. You have to be civilized, which means going against your intuitions and not trusting them. All right, so that's... Karen says that our leadership feels we're better together. How do we change this? So we'll talk a little bit about how to collaborate effectively. And I think one of the things that leadership feels when people, when the leadership feels that people are better together, it generally results from two things. Leadership feels that, hey, we want to see each other. We're comfortable together. It's important to have the team collaboration. And that's one thing. That's the push. Uh, that's the pull. And the push is that they have not worked 
that they have not strategically adapted to collaborating effectively during the pandemic. They have not strategically adapted to effective virtual collaboration, meaning they haven't done it right. They didn't do it right so that they feel bad about, hey, what's you know the, the current ways of doing things during this virtual work because they don't haven't done it right. They feel that they need to go back to their previous ways of doing things. They haven't figured out what are the right ways of actually collaborating effectively in the virtual world. So that's the kind of dynamics that you have to navigate. And you have to in integrate effective virtual collaboration practices and see how those work out before you say that we need to be back together. Because if you haven't done it right in the first place, you know, by virtual work, virtual collaboration, then just saying, oh, this doesn't work, we need to be back together is just like not a reasonable statement. <laughs> Okay, so Susan uh, says that upper management is expecting staff to come into the office as before, but staff who have school age children have more challenges than those with, with more resources. Yep. Similarly, those who are at risk or fearful of contracting COVID are looked down on, on if they don't want to come to the office. And lots of guilt being leveraged that people who need to work remotely. Yes, these are various strategies that management unfortunately uses to try to get people to go back to the office. And that's one of the things that, again, you want to understand why they want people to go back to the office. A lot of times when I see my staff wanting to go back, people to go back to the office is because they haven't done the virtual work correctly. They haven't done it right. They don't, they feel that, oh, they try, they just impose their in-office preferences and ways of collaborating on the virtual work, whether it's team meetings every week, whether it's for work activities, and that's the way that people engage. And then the management notices that the staff is not engaged during those meetings, that they don't get the same sort of engaging outcomes that they get during their in-office activities and they want to go back to the office, and that's a problem. And then those Zoom happy hours and those ways of collaborating where people don't set boundaries. There are lots of expectations about how much time you work. So managers generally, the problem is that they have not adapted effective virtual work practices. They haven't even researched what are the effective work virtual work practices. They've just tried to do the same things that they've done before, which doesn't work, of course, because virtual work is different than in-person work. And so now they feel that this virtual work doesn't work well for them, doesn't work for company culture, and they want to force everyone to go back to the office. It's, it's a big problem. It's a serious problem. Let's see. So uh, Andy sent me personally, uh, by the way, everyone, when you're sending a message to chat, make sure to hit the everyone button versus sending it to me personally. I'll read the message that Andy sent, but just keep in mind, you want to send the message to everyone. So Andy said that the financial services industry seems to be less likely to allow remote work. The industry seems to be led by older white employees. Do you believe that the hesitation to allow remote work is related to being more regulated industry and those associated risks are because leadership is more comfortable with the prior status quo? I definitely think it's not related to regulatory risks. And here's why. When you're talking about the financial services industry, what we're seeing is that the people who are trying to work remotely are the big financial investment banks in New York City, a lot of them, and the bigger financial investment banks. When I look, when I work with, when I look at smaller companies, smaller professional financial services companies, a lot of them are allowing their employees full-time remote work, and they're hiring a lot of those investment bankers who, and the financial service professionals who are forced to go back to the office. So smaller companies are getting really good talent who they just couldn't compete for before because a lot of this good talent wants to do full-time remote work. So we're clearly seeing a lot of this talent going and you could see a lot of, I, I have some internal sources and in, uh, these companies, but also Wall Street Journal, I think a month ago published an article about this, about how talent is fleeing big investment banks and other financial services firms. So we're seeing that, you know, a number of financial services firms losing talent. We're also seeing, so another aspect of financial services is let's say insurance industries. I just met with the risk management leader from State Farm, which is a mid-sized insurance company 
here in Columbus where I'm based, so go Bucks. And it, we were talking about this and he was saying how they are going to, they're allowing something like 85% of their workers to work virtually and how nationwide, which is also insurance, which is based in Columbus, um, a number of their divisions are gonna have permanent full-time work for 75% plus of their employees. So those aspects of the financial industry, a number of companies in the financial industry clearly are allowing full-time remote work. By contrast, within insurance, AIG is forcing all of its employees to go back to the office in September, which is pretty silly given the Delta surge, but that's what's happening. So we see differences in companies, and I'm predicting that we'll see the companies that are permitting more full-time remote work having more talent and retaining more talent. So uh, Philip says that a question that was sent to him is what are my thoughts on a company having employers come back to the office in September, hybrid and full-time, but only for vaccinated employees? I think it's a serious problem given the Delta surge. So even companies like Apple. We'll talk about the Delta surge a little bit in one of the cognitive biases, but basically the Delta surge, you've probably seen the research on the booster shots and so on, all of this information. And that's coming from research showing that vaccinated people are very much able to unfortunately transmit the COVID to each other, the Delta version of COVID, get sick, transmit it. So that's a serious problem, even Apple. So Apple is really fighting employees because Apple really wanted to go back to the office full time, but even Apple is delaying it's going back to the office because of the Delta surge. So I think if a company is not delaying going back to the office because of the Delta surge, even for vaccinated employees only, that is a very serious problem. And that's not, not good from the perspective of what you want to effectively accomplish for your employees. Oh, thank you for clarifying, Angie. All right, so this seems to be the end of questions and this seems to be a perfect time to take a 10 minute break. So we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back at five past. All right, everyone, so go ahead, take a break and we'll come back at five past. All right, and Philip, let me know if you're able to figure out breakout rooms. If not, then you know, we're not gonna do that. Understood, I'm gonna look at it right now. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, everyone, see you back at five in 10 minutes.
I will give folks another minute or so uh, to get back and then we'll start. All right, everyone. Everyone should be back by now. It's been a minute past, so let's start with the next cognitive bias, the next dangerous judgment error that happens here. What's that one? This is called the false consensus effect. The false consensus effect. Well, what's that about? We talked about the surveys. We talked about how people surveyed, kind of the external surveys. There's extensive information out there. The surveys that I quoted started coming out in early spring of 2021 this year, and they came out through late spring of 2021. There's still surveys occasionally coming out. I saw surveys, when was this? I saw one coming out something like two days ago that talked about this sort of stuff. But anyway, there's extensive external surveys by very highly credible organizations available on what employees actually want, all of that stuff we talked about before. But what leaders tend to feel is that they kind of ignore these external surveys and they often don't take internal surveys. They have a feeling resulting from the tribalism that those with whom they are in a shared tribe, those whom they lead, from whom they are a tribal leader, that they will agree with their perspectives. That's an incorrect belief that others in our tribe share our preferences, such as coming into the office. So there's a feeling, there's a belief that people share our preferences, that others share preferences. And if they, the feeling that is, if they don't even verbally say, maybe they verbally say that they don't, but they really do. And they'll change their mind pretty quickly once you kind of insist on your preferences and shame them, guilt them, whatever the other stuff that some of the people were sharing. So thank you for sharing that. And this is called the false consensus effect. The leaders at Google discovered this to their chagrin, as I told you, where they wasted billions of dollars and had to change their plans on May 5th. Amazon, again, wasted billions of dollars, changed their plan on June 10th. Uber wasted billions of dollars, changed their plan on something like June 24th. And many other companies are realizing right now that they will need to change their plans, whether it's the Delta search, whether it's with other dynamics, this is the false consensus effect, where they fail to gather information from their people about this. Now, I was working consulting for a large organization that, can, that consists of peer executive groups across the world, in, but heavily centered in the United States. So across the world, organizations, global organization, heavily centered in the US, of peer executives of middle market companies, organizations ranging from maybe 50-ish people to something like 3,000 people. That's kind of their typical members. Some a little low, lower, some a little higher for, in terms of the number of people in the companies they run. And they asked, as part of this engagement, we asked the peer executives who are running these companies, how many of you did surveys of your employees on coming back to the workplace? How many of you did surveys of your employees? Well, 
what happened with the survey answer was really interesting. And it turned out that only 44% of them surveyed their employees on what their employees would prefer in coming back to the workplace. So 44% 40, of them surveyed their employees. That is a sadly low number, but that's what happens. Very surprisingly few companies survey their employees or in any sort of good way of coming back to the office. And this is a serious problem on coming back to the office. Now, at this point, I'd like you to share in the chat about whether your company surveyed its employees on coming back to the office and what it found, that if you remember the survey, kind of approximate breakdowns. So please go ahead, take a minute to share in the chat whether your company surveyed its employees, didn't survey its employees, your organization did so, and what happened as a result of the survey. So please go ahead. So far, I see about maybe seven, eight of each. And one with specific results was that 25% wanted remote, 50% wanted hybrid, 25% wanted in the office, which is just right in the middle of what the external surveys indicate. Surveyed, I think. Okay, so surveys and uh, generally the ones who report on what happened with surveys was the results weren't provided. And uh, Kelsey just said that they were careful in the response to the pandemics. Okay, good, thank you. Okay. If you accidentally turned your microphone on, please turn it off. Thank you. Okay, so no surveys and preferences from Doris. All right, so we could see that maybe something, maybe about half of the companies surveyed their employees, half of them didn't. And again, this is a pretty serious problem that when employees aren't surveyed, and even when employees are surveyed, but the results are not shared with employees, that is a big, big problem because it makes it seem like, well, the results are secret because the preferences of the leadership don't match what the survey says. And so the leadership wants to keep the survey secret. That is not a good look. So if you are, in any, if you are involved in a company that did a survey and the results were not made available and you have any sort of influence with the leadership on what on making this the results of the survey available, I would strongly recommend making the results of the survey available, even if it doesn't fit very well what the leadership wants, because you don't want it to appear like you're secretive and you're hiding something. All right. Let's talk about another cognitive bias, the confirmation bias. So we talked about how leaders don't gather the right information in many places, of course, some of them were surveyed and reported, but in many, many places, leaders don't gather the right information. Well, what is inform how do the leaders do engage with information? So I want to talk a little bit about that. The confirmation bias is about how leaders engage with information. Fortunately, it's a problem. It's a cognitive bias. It's a problematic judgment error. So cognitive bias, where we tend to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. This is a quick mental shortcut that was really functional in the savannah because we had to make judgments very, very quickly, whether you know we have whether it's a tiger or not, and it's better for us to fit our judgment and fit our intuition, which was to jump at the shadow very quickly. Unfortunately, that's not good in the modern environment, where it's much better for us to consider information that goes against our beliefs and doesn't fit our intuitions to make better judgments. Now, what happened, so the number of companies at which I worked before, they, the one they brought me in, 
what I found before pushing them to take surveys was that surveys weren't taken. And what they did instead is that the CEO talked to the C-suite, the C-suite staff executives, top executives talked to the senior VPs, and that's it. <laughs> and then they all decided, well, we all want to go back to the office, therefore we should go back to the office, and therefore the employees will be fine going back to the office. Uh, the companies where no surveys were taken, I suspect that's mostly what, what took place. Now think about who these people are, the CEO, the rest of the C-suite, and then the SVPs. These are people who are successful because they've been in the office for their whole careers, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. That's what they associate with success with the in-office presence, that they they can keep account, that they keep can keep people accountable, that they can look at people and see people, they can perceive and visibly see that people are working. They don't have to worry about people slacking off and lack of productivity. They don't have to worry about disengagement and lack of morale. They know how to function. They know how to lead. They know how to manage in the office. They don't know how to manage remotely very well. And they kind of, many, many people did not, did not adapt effectively. Overwhelmingly, I'll say this, <laughs> companies did not adapt effectively to virtual work during the pandemic. They have not adopted best practices. They haven't even researched what best practices are. They just impose their in-office preferences on this work. And so they kind of ignore the really strong hard data about the major damages to retention, recruitment, morale, engagement, productivity, well-being, work-life balance, stress, health, and your bottom line from coming back to the office. So that's the confirmation bias. And this is a very serious issue that unfortunately many leaders tend to suffer from. All right, so let's talk about another cognitive bias. And this one relates more directly to the Delta surge and its implications. And still companies are not very well adapted to it's a big serious problem. We tend to feel that things will continue to go normally, that things will continue on their previous trends. So what happened with the vaccines? Now, vaccines were perceived as taking the situation back to normal. Okay, widespread vaccination, vaccines are widely available. Therefore, we should go back to normal and everything will go back to as it previously was, the pandemic is over. That was the perception around the vaccines. And leaders perceived that things were going to continue to go normally. And they greatly underestimated the high likelihood of variants. I mean, variants were talked about from the very beginning. I mean, if you remember the variant that caused the surge of infections in the March, April timeframe, and then the alpha variant, and then now we have the Delta variant. That was becoming already pretty clear in May when it was causing a surge in Israel and in the UK, which were both highly vaccinated countries. So it was starting to surge, not yet in the US, it started to surge in the US in kind of mid late June, but already it was seen, it was very visible that it was going to be a serious issue. And so I wrote an article for Fortune about this and they published it and I linked that, I put it in the chat for you to share with leaders for who are still trying to make people come back to the office in September and October. And what happened was that with, with the surge, right, June, July, it was becoming pretty clear that cases were surging. We were having evidence come out about the seriousness of the Delta surge, that vaccines are not that effective against the Delta surge with waning efficacy. And this is what the long tail risks are. So long tail risk of variants, meaning the serious likelihood of bad, bad negative impacts from variants are greatly underestimated. So Israeli data shows that vaccinated people with Pfizer, so really the vaccine that's most present in the US is Pfizer, I think it's something like 55% and Moderna at something like 35%. And Johnson & Johnson is just under, uh, just under 10%. So Pfizer and Moderna are pretty similar and Israel used Pfizer. It found that vaccine effectiveness after six months against the Delta variant is down to 39%. 39%, that's not great for symptomatic infections. So symptomatic infections down to 39% after six months that is not cool. That is not a good outcome. And this new Delta Plus variant is also something that's worrisome. It's spreading. It's present 
in the Bay Area, 11 other countries, and more countries, it's increasingly spreading elsewhere. And it's just as infectious as Delta, it looks like, but it's more resistant to vaccines. So it has a mutation that makes it more resistant to vaccines. So that might be the next surge, who knows? It's quite possible that Delta will not be the end of the variants and we need to plan for it to not be the end of the variants, right? We need to manage risks effectively. Now, when you look at Delta, we see that a lot of companies are really making the mistakes. The company that who the person mentioned wants the people to come back in September, that's not a good idea. The, considering the Delta is slated to peak sometime in October, November. I mean, in some states, it'll, I mean, the cases from Delta are higher than they've ever been throughout the pandemic. Florida is a clear example, a number of other cases. Hospitalizations are higher than they've ever been throughout the pandemic. You know, deaths will soon follow. Hopefully they won't be as high because older people are more vaccinated, but still the pretty high deaths. I mean, we have, we're over a thousand deaths per, per day. This is really bad at hospitalizations, super strain. This is a big, big problem. And the peak is not slated to be until, like I said, sometime in mid late fall. Now, this was forecast already in early June when cases were surging that the peak was going to be in mid late fall. And we saw a number of companies making some pretty bad decisions. I mean, Apple has been talking about, we're talking about Apple, right? Super large, I think it's the largest company right now, or one of the largest. It's definitely one of the top large, around a $2 trillion company. And it was saying, okay, we're gonna get our employees back in September. September is when we're coming back, September, September. No, then when they saw the Delta surge and they, were seeing it, they were waiting, they were evaluating. And then July 24th, they announced that, okay, we're not gonna come back in September, we're gonna come back in October. <laughs> now, how does that make sense when you're responding to the Delta surge? Very clearly, it's going to peak in mid late fall. That's what the forecasts are all suggesting. It's going to be really bad until then. And you're gonna make your people come back and, and you delayed from September to October? That is just nonsense. That is not a good decision at all. It's kind of making yourself a laughing stock. Completely not evidence based, completely not science driven. I mean, Apple tries to pride itself on being science driven and evidence based, but this is completely not that. I mean, they really screwed up. So, not a good decision. I think a few days ago they said, okay, we're, we screwed up. Sorry, we're going to come back in, in January. So, this is something that we need to realize that. They screwed up and they said, we're going to come back in January. But what happens when there's potentially another variant? What happens then? You don't want to set that date for January or something like that. You want to set it based on case load, based on case counts, not saying that come back in January. That's not very good at all. And that makes you seem to not really be science-based and science-driven. Now, what's a much, much better approach the, to for your risk management, for your company culture. And of course, as internal auditors, you really want to be thinking about areas of risk management is to make sure that some in your company are always fully virtual. Some in your company should always be fully virtual so that for the sake of your risk management and your company culture, for the sake of your company culture, having some fully virtual makes it makes it easy for everyone to go back to fully virtual, that you have systems and processes in place, both for your auditing and for everything else, that you can always do them fully virtually if needed. If you know, I mean, if you're in Florida right now, you should definitely not be in the office. If you're in a number of other states that you're, you know, even hybrid teams, you should not be working hybrid. If you can do your work remotely, you should do all your work remotely, just because the vaccines are not very effective against Delta with waning efficacy, which is why the Biden administration decided on booster shots after eight months for adults and already immunocompromised people are able to get them. This is not good. And the you know, some of the science suggests that they should we should be giving booster shots in an earlier period, maybe four to five months would be the right period. I suspect they put eight months because they are still waiting for FDA full approval. But for the sake of your risk management and your company culture, it's good to have some people be always fully virtual in all teams so that everyone can go to fully virtual, so that your risk management and so that your ERM, enterprise risk management, so that your company culture systems and processes are well adapted 
to always functioning fully virtually if necessary, while also permitting a number of people to be back in the office so that you know, something like 10 to 30% of your people work remotely, the rest working on you know, one to two to three day schedule, hybrid schedule, that would be the best perspective from risk management and company culture to address the tail risk of variants, not simply Delta, but others, and as well as other sorts of disasters that are coming up, whether it's hurricanes and all of those sorts of things. I'll be happy to take questions on this portion of the normal bias, if anyone has any questions on the confirmation bias and on issues around the Delta surge right now, as well as any comments about what's going on in your company that you want to share about. Dr. Glad, we've got a question on uh, an individual witnessing bias at their company at the senior management level. Uh -huh. I guess the question is, have you seen, um, you know, any, I guess, effective or appropriate kind of ways to address that? Uh, obviously knowing, you know, talking up to senior management can be a challenge. Yeah, talking to senior management can be a challenge. One way to do so, so that one of the reasons I shared the article with you was so that you can, to send the article to senior management about the sort of these cognitive biases and ask them, oh, I read this article, what do you think? Or send them a recording of this presentation and say, hey, you know, attended this presentation, what do you think? So raising this question about potential negative consequences of forcing people to go back to the office, and the negative consequences of leaders not recognizing some of the cognitive biases that are causing them to be making some bad decisions. So I think there is where you want, that's kind of how you want to raise those questions with the leadership, not say, I see you have this cognitive bias, you should not have this cognitive bias, that's a bad idea. <laughs> but raising this question in the sort of, here's a resource, what do you think way is a more innocuous and not, it's not a career limiting move <laughs> way of saying this. It's just kind of bringing a resource to the attention of leadership or helping them in their professional development, leadership growth, and asking them, you know, what they think about this resource. And that opens up the conversation in a much more innocuous way and allows you to do that. So that's what I would suggest. And that's what has worked well for others. Other folks, other questions about any aspects of the Delta surge? By the way, questions I get about the Delta surge, I sometimes get questions about long COVID and Delta surge, both for vaccination and non-vaccination. So what the recent research is suggesting about long COVID is it's a pretty serious issue. So the latest research I saw that was that symptoms of long COVID, they range from chronic fatigue to lack of smell to all sorts of other issues, myocardia issues and so on. So lots and lots of issues that are, can be pretty problematic. And the, they can last on average for what we know now is at least six months. So at least six months for those who get long COVID, they about 20% of people who get symptomatic COVID infections get long COVID, which means that some of these symptoms, a combination of them, at least one persists for over six months. That is a pretty serious problem, especially if it's something like chronic fatigue. I mean, that's that's pretty bad. But others can be bad too, you know, my cardio trouble breathing can be bad. You know, all of those sorts of things could be bad. Brain fog can be pretty bad. So that's an issue. And for people who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated, I get that question too. It's unfortunately, and this sucks, it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated for the sake of long COVID. If you do have a symptomatic infection, meaning, and we're not even talking about people who go to the hospital. So this is about putting aside people who go to the hospital and who have various long-term conditions because they're in the hospital and they, let's say their muscles wasted away and they're weak because of that. We're not talking about those people. So the we're talking about the range of people, not people who have COVID and are asymptomatic, but people who get COVID, who get now the Delta pretty much, and do have symptoms, but don't go to the hospital. So that percentage of people, which is something, which is, a, I mean, I think something like maybe 10 to 20% of people with COVID get hospitalized. So it's a pretty large percentage of people who don't get hospitalized, but who do get symptoms. So if you have symptoms and aren't hospitalized, it's about 20% of you will have some symptoms remaining 
at the rate within the six month period. So this is pretty serious. So you don't want to you know, mess around with this long COVID, even if you're vaccinated, because it really doesn't matter. According to the research, whether you're vaccinated, you will still get those long COVID symptoms if you, if you get a symptomatic infection. Okay, so that's what I want to say about long COVID. So again, questions about any aspects of the Delta surge, vaccine effectiveness, long COVID, the normalcy bias and confirmation bias. I'll be happy to take those. Put them in the chat. So Cami asks if Delta variant spreads more easily than the original virus outside. Yeah, absolutely. It spreads more easily anywhere. It spreads more easily outside. So you have to be a little bit more careful outside than you were before. But as long as you socially distance outside, you should be pretty fine. If it's not a crowd, it still should be pretty fine. But if you don't socially distance or if you're in a crowd, you are more likely to get it than you got the original Delta. Then you got the original, I'm sorry, then you got the original variant, which is the alpha now, what we're calling alpha now. Yes, Kenny. Other questions about Delta or anything else? Okay. So I assume no more questions. Then let's proceed to the last cognitive bias I want to make you aware of. And this is about how we think and operate within our existing systems and processes. When we learn one way of doing things, we tend to perceive that way as the only right way to function. It's a big, big problem for in office culture. I told you, I mentioned a number of times when what happened with the lockdowns in March, 2020. Leaders, managers perceive only one way to manage, to lead, to collaborate in office. They have this perception, okay, this is how we do things. This is how we lead. This is how we manage. And that of course depends on people being there in person. And so how do they manage during the remote work during the March 2020 lockdowns. Well, they transposed their in-office culture, ways of collaborating, leading, innovating, all of these sorts of activities that you do in office. They transposed those on just their in-office um, on virtual work at that point. And guess what? Many of these did not work out well. The, I hear from managers all the time complaining about how at their team meetings, their weekly team meetings, people are disengaged. They appear to not be paying attention. They appear to not be you know, doing the things that the managers want them to be doing, maybe even texting or you know, doing something else while you know, not keeping their eyes on the screen, doing something else, turning their videos off and appearing to be checking their emails. <laughs> so that's one reason why managers want to go back to the office. Zoom happy hours, again, I talked about that. Managers are finding that these are disengaging, that their workers are complaining about this. So they want to go back to the office. They're finding that their workers aren't collaborating well together, aren't working together as well as they previously did when they're in the office, aren't helping each other, aren't mentoring each other. There's less on the job learning, less integration into the team. And so they're trying, they're thinking, how do I fix this? I'll fix this by going back to the office and so on. They're not innovating as much. How do I fix the innovation problem? But they're not creating these ideas, which I really need to keep a competitive edge. I'll go back to the office. This is the mindset. Instead of looking at best practices of how to innovate anywhere and collaborate everywhere, looking at these best practices and figuring out how do you actually do things well, do things right? That is a big, big, serious problem, this functional fixedness. So the second half of the presentation will be about these best practices for virtual and hybrid work activities. How do you do them well? But we need to understand what the problem is, where the managers have this problematic mindset that they're not doing the right things effectively, unfortunately. So that's a serious problem.
I'll be happy to take any questions about functional fixedness right now. Please go ahead. All right, if no questions, then let's do a poll on which of the cognitive biases that I talked about already do you think might be most problematic for the return to the office in your workplace? So please go ahead and vote. I see that almost 90% of you participated. I'll give you five more seconds if you haven't voted yet. So please go ahead and vote. All right, let's end the poll. Let's share the results. Okay, so we see that the status quo bias is overwhelmingly the largest one. So we have nearly half of you citing that as the biggest problem. Following that is the normalcy bias on not anticipating the impacts of various major disruptions. And again, the pandemic itself is a major disruption. The 2008-2009 fiscal crisis is a major disruption. And of course, the Delta variant itself is a smaller but still very serious disruption. We don't anticipate those nearly enough and what's, what kind of other variants are going to come down the pipeline, right? and we don't plan for those, that's a problem. And functional fixedness is a very, very serious issue. Good, so. Now, I'm going to share my screen and I want you to bring up your chat function right now. We'll be using chat for this next section. <clears throat> I often get asked, how do you figure out which cognitive biases are most problematic in my workplace? How do I even address these cognitive biases? One of the ways, so if you, one of the questions I got was, how do you highlight to leaders that there's cognitive bias that they might be feeling, might be experiencing and falling into these cognitive biases? So besides sending them specific articles, another way to address cognitive bias in the workplace and to bring it to people's attention is to do an assessment on cognitive bias. And leaders really like assessments, as you might well know, that this is a very useful tool for leaders. They find it useful for themselves. And you can find it useful, if you're not a leader, to encourage your leaders to take the assessment and then have the other team members take the assessment because it gets at some of the issues that I'm talking about here. So this assessment is... I'll give you the directions first. So each of the questions below refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. And it, you don't need to know what the you know, cognitive bias, you don't need to know the fix, functional fixedness, you don't need to know the specific bias itself. You just need to know a behavior. It talks about specific behaviors that you know, everyone can witness. And these are easy and observable behaviors that are tangible and that are very clear and concrete, that are very obvious to witness. So these are the behaviors. And the question is, how often did it occur in the workplace in percentage terms out of how many times it could have occurred? So situations when it could have occurred versus when it actually did occur. Now, if you're doing this assessment, you can focus it on your, on your team itself. You can focus on the organization, whatever you're thinking, whatever business unit. You don't want to overthink each question. It shouldn't take you more than 15 to 20 seconds for each question. So let's go for some of the questions, just so you know what those are. Now, what percentage of all projects missed the deadline or went over budget? I want you to use the chat and tell me what percentage of all projects in your organization missed the deadline or went over budget in the past year. So percentage out of all the projects that happened, what's the percentage that went over time that went over budget? Please go ahead. So I see 
65, 1 to 10%, 50, 20%, 10%, 60%, 25 to 35, 20, 10. 1 to 10%, 15, 20, 10, 25%. Go ahead, share if you haven't shared yet. Get a couple more people. 30%. All right, so this relates to a cognitive bias called the planning fallacy, the planning fallacy. We tend to make plans and we feel that our plans will work out well. Unfortunately, they sometimes do not work out well, but we tend to underestimate and not anticipate nearly sufficiently when our plans will not work out well. We see this all the time. I mean, we're talking about the return to the office, right? Where companies had to change the return to the office plans because of the Delta surge. And they made certain plans and then that was a problem for them when they made plans because they did not anticipate the Delta surge. And of course, we saw this in you know, Google and Amazon and Uber that changed their plans because of the employee resistance. So let's just return to the office. There are so many other areas where companies don't anticipate sufficiently the kind of problems that they're going to be facing. And this, if, you get, if your answer was in the you know, one to 10% range, 20 to 30, you know, that's not too much. When you're getting into the 30 and above, 30%, 40%, that's more serious because the planning fallacy, it feels good to make those plans. I often say that, you know, there's a saying that failing to plan is planning to fail. It's a good saying, but it really, underestimates the reality that what you need to do is plan for problems. So much better saying is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. People don't anticipate and address the kind of resources and time that they will need effectively if you're especially in that 30 to 40% range and, and above. That's the very serious issue. It's called the planning fallacy. Let's see. Now, this one is about the normalcy bias. As you can tell, that didn't include contingencies for threats that were unlikely to occur, but could be pretty serious if they did occur, so major disruptions. So let's go on question number 20. When did you, how many of your plans don't include major disruption contingencies in your organization? So please go ahead for question 20. Major disruption contingencies, normalcy bias. So we have 50%, 40 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%, 50%
30, 20, 30. This seems a little bit higher than the, nor than the normal C bias. This seems kind of a little bit more prevalent than the normal C bias. So of course, the false consensus effect. This is a serious issue for team collaboration, for team engagement. I mean, if you think that other people in the team agree with you, but they don't actually agree with you, that's a big, big, serious problem. And of course, for all of these, if it's kind of getting into the, getting over 20%, especially in the 30% range or more, you definitely want to address this. You want to bring this to the attention of your leadership and address it. Now, let's talk about this one. Let's talk about people's feelings. Of all times when someone was evaluating a situation and making a decision in your organization, in what percentage of cases did they underestimate how strongly other people feel about this issue, whether it's employees, customers, vendors, or other stakeholders? So please go ahead. Underestimation of how intensely other people feel. 50%, 20%. 15%, 75%, 20%, 40%, 40%, 25%, another 65, I think that was supposed to be 30%, not 300%, uh, 25%, 50%, 55%, 60, 50. So this seems to be even more serious than the previous one. So <laughs> rising in seriousness. This is called the empathy gap. So we tend to underestimate the intensity of emotions, both ourselves, our own emotions and other people's emotions. And especially in this case, is you know, focusing on other people's emotions with the empathy gap here about issues, about topics. So the empathy gap relates to us just underestimating emotions. We tend to perceive ourselves and others as being more rational and logical and reasonable than we actually are. And we tend to perceive others as being kind of more focused on information gathering and so on. And really underestimate, and this applies to managers, to everyone, underestimating how intense their emotions are. So, so many leaders, so many managers are underestimating the intensity of emotions of people about returning back to the office. They tend to ignore the reality of how seriously those people feel about remote work, hybrid, substantial remote work, what they want and what the consequences will be of the return to the office. So this tends to be a pretty serious issue. It's called the empathy gap, the empathy gap. So these are the 30 questions, just so you know what the, the and there are similar questions, right? All 30 of them. Then after that, so that you know what's going on next, you'll get a scoring rubric. And I'll send this to those who want this assessment after the presentation where you score how much you did, and then you look at the score, you look at the consequences of the score, and that are going on through the, what the comp, how the company did. That's the assessment, then the impact evaluation. And here, this is especially useful for the management because it allows you to do a rough estimate of the financial estimate impact of the errors you uncovered. So managers always want the business case, you know, what's going on, how does it impact the bottom line, the PNL responsibility, because that's what they have. So this allows them to do a financial uh, estimate of the impact. Competencies. So there are certain competencies that you evaluate the through this assessment, through the self, and there are four competencies here that are going to be relevant in terms of these cognitive biases. Evaluations of oneself, that's one competency. Evaluations of others, strategic evaluation of risks and rewards, and tactical evaluations and project management, so operational issues. So you'll be able to see how well your company and or your team does whatever you focus the assessment on, on these questions. And each of them talks about how to do so. You take some questions from the assessment and you add it up, you divide it by the appropriate amount and you get a percentage. And finally, the next steps are addressing these dangerous judgment errors. That's what the end of the assessment is about. So you look over your answers and the questions, focusing on the ones you answered 30 or higher, and then you prioritize the ones that need the most immediate work. And then, that one, then others in the short term, medium term, and later. 
So I don't want to do more than three questions per set if the questions are unrelated, but it's fine to select more if they're within a single competency, which is why it's important to evaluate competencies. And then you can decide whether how to work on the issues. And there's going to be resources in the book that you get on how to work on these issues. And that talks about each of these. So number one, for example, we talked about the projects that missed the deadline or went over budget. So we talked about the problems that result and the resources that you'll get. We'll talk about how to address each of these problems. So this is what the assessment looks like so that you have an, an idea of what it's about. All right, that's it. I'll be happy to take questions about the assessment, introducing it to leadership, all of these sorts of topics right now. And if there are no, if there aren't any other questions about the assessment, I'll be happy to take any questions about cognitive biases in general. We're reaching the end of the section, then we'll have a break after we finish the section. So please ask any questions about cognitive biases that you feel you would still like to know that aren't clear to you. All right, so we'll take a 10 minute, let's take a 15 minute break because I see it's gonna come up to some people might want to prepare their lunch. So let's take a 15 minute break in case some folks might want to start preparing their lunch and you know, you can eat during the presentation, obviously that's not a problem. So let's do a 15 minute break. It's 12.52, it's 11.52 right now or 53. Yeah, let, let's just give to 10 after. So for, so we'll give to 10 after, so, We'll reconvene at 12.10. So reconvening at 12.10 for those of you who might want to prepare your lunch. I know it's about halfway through the presentation, so please go ahead and do that. All right, we'll, I'll see you back at 12.10.
Well, everyone will give folks another minute-ish or so to get back and then we'll start. All right, so this should have been enough for folks to come back. So let's restart. I see that Suzanne has entered a question in the meantime. What responses have I received from companies when helping them see their biases about working from home? I've had quite good responses. So in terms of leaders expressing gratitude for this, because they, when I speak to them with my credibility, with my engagement, with the kind of, research basis that I'm able to bring and with the experience of external benchmarks, they're realizing that, hey, they've been kind of screwing up in terms of what they were perceiving as going on because they were perceiving, they, were, they really generally fall into functional fixedness pretty seriously. And they see they did not really adapt new ways of collaborating during the pandemic that were fit to the virtual format. And so they were perceiving virtual work as being much worse and much less innovative, collaborative, productive, engaging, effective than it actually could be if you adopt best practices. So that's kind of one angle. And the second angle, I mean, a number of leaders did acknowledge that they fall into the status quo bias, kind of the false, con false consensus effect, the confirmation bias, normalcy bias, especially a big one with the Delta surge. So they acknowledge that they realize that, you know, they're human beings, they're imperfect, they fall into this. And it's easier to acknowledge it to me as sort of an external actor who comes in and who is able to give them external feedback and benchmarking. I mean, I work with the largest companies, like I said, I'm, I just got a testimonial from, um, uh, so I can name them because they gave me a testimonial from JLL, which is a Fortune 200 real estate company and they were very grateful for me for pointing out these errors that they were making about effective virtual and hybrid work and so they gave me a testimonial literally saying this that they're grateful to me thank you for doing this thank you for helping us as a training consulting sort of activity and uh, that they were going to do better going forward so that's top fund company top firms regular that's the regular feedback i get so i think you can that's one of the reasons I encourage you to use the resources that I shared to, and that I will share for those who want to opt into my resources to provide them with these resources because they're coming from a external, highly regarded expert in these topics who can actually speak to these issues. And then you can start that conversation by having the topic, raising the question, well, you now here's some Here's someone I, whose presentation I saw. This was interesting. I want to share this resource with you. With you, what do you think? So that's kind of the broad take. And here, the coincidentally, the next point in the presentation is actually a quote from a leader that I wanted to highlight that I think is very indicative. So this is a tech CEO company, 
larger company, sort of mid-sized, middle market company. It's not a Fortune 500, of course, it only has 4,000 employees. So that would be in the middle market sector, a little bit on the larger side of middle market sector. And here's what the CEO told me after I consulted with him about these cognitive biases and about how do you actually have best practices for working in virtual work and hybrid work. He told me the first that he really likes working with other people. He's extroverted, he's engaged, social engaging. This is why he likes it. So I'm gonna, that, that's my comment, but let me read the rest of it. And you could see that on your screen. I really like working with other people. I'm uncomfortable working with myself by myself. It's just not the same. So I'd love to have everyone go back to the office five days a week, right? That's the typical perspective. Now, however, he says, we're doing a lot of hiring for managerial roles right now to prepare for the post-pandemic recovery. And again, this is a tech company, so they're growing and they're preparing for the recovery. One of the first questions applicants ask is if they have to move and how much time they can work from home, especially younger ones. Frequent question. So this is a recruitment question. I guess I have to accept the fact that the new generation of leaders and employees doesn't have the same preferences that I do. Our most important resources are people. I need to make sure that I'm tapping that resource most effectively. So that's what a good leader does. Anyone who's a good leader who recognizes, they are going to recognize that their preferences, I mean, what makes someone actually a good leader? When you think about someone who's a good leader, who's a good manager, not, a, not simply a CEO, but at the lowest level, supervisor of a six to eight people team, what makes someone a good leader? What makes someone a good manager? It's being able to recognize that your intuitive preferences and the way you like to do things are not necessarily going to be the best thing for you to meet your business objectives, for you to meet your business outcomes. Because if you can not do that, then you're really going to underperform for your company and your company or your organization, whatever your mission is, is not going to do nearly as well as it could be. You need to realize that your intuitions will in many cases be simply flat out wrong. And that in order to get the right business objectives and outcomes as this tech CEO did, you have to overcome your intuitions and go against them in order to make the right decisions. So that's what I would answer to that question. All right, let's talk about what is the actual best practice of going back to the office. And if you want to seize competitive advantage for yourself, for your company, for your team in the future of work. So this is what we're talking about after the pandemic, no longer after the COVID transforms from being pandemic to endemic. And for those who don't know what the difference, I mean, pandemic is obviously you know, a very serious issue. Endemic is, means becomes more like the flu, where it's not nearly as serious, where we have people who are not dying in large numbers and hospitals are not being overstrained because of it. So to perhaps we get a second generation vaccine where that is much more effective against COVID than one that whose effectiveness wanes to 39% after six months. So, and people are get widespread vaccination. Perhaps we get more immunity as people who are unfortunately resistant to vaccination choose to you know, and, and get COVID, but survive through it. They get immunity just like they've gotten immunity to the flu, some immunity to the flu and it becomes not as serious. That's what endemic means. So we're talking about post pandemic, what that means. And what the best practice is going to be a team-led model. That means that the CEO doesn't go down and says and say, everyone is going to come back to the office Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, which is what Apple is trying to do. Monday, Tuesday, it's kind of a ridiculous schedule also. Why give your why give your staff you know, a day in the middle and when they you know they can't even go and take some time, they have to go back to the office on Thursday. So they have to go to that midday that, and they can't even, you know, go for the weekend somewhere for four days and come back to do three days. It, 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 it's bad in a number of ways, but you don't do, go and say, I'm the CEO. This is what everyone does. You go, a you do a team led model. What that means is you let the team supervisors, the people managers at the lowest level 
the ones who lead six to eight people teams, kind of the managers, supervisors, whatever the team size is, but you know what I'm talking about. It could be a two people team. It could be like a 10 people team, but that lowest level, you give them the flexibility of deciding what works best for their team within a certain set of broad guidelines. And you tell them that here's the broad guidelines. You do hybrid first, that means for most people, and a minority fully remote. That is what the best practice is for all sorts of companies, including manufacturing companies. I mentioned that Fortune 200 manufacturing company with which I'm working right now, which is doing this, and large, other large manufacturing companies. This is the best practice across the board. The difference is going to be how many people of your, you have working remotely. And some companies, I mean, there was one company for which I consulted, which decided to have something like 80 to 80 to 90 percent of its people working full-time remote but that's less frequent just because they were doing so much individual work it depends on how much collaborative work you do and what kind of a company culture you want to have how you want to collaborate together but especially if you're doing a lot of individual work you don't not doing much teamwork then it's fine to do the majority remote but for more company most companies the best model is going to be hybrid first with minority remote. So hybrid employees, that's one to three days in the office, and that's going to be the majority of your workforce. So if you're like the manufacturing company for which, of which I'm working with right now, that's going to be closer to 90% hybrid. I think they have something like 85-ish percent hybrid. Then if you're going to be a different sort of company, they're like, more of a tech company or financial services or what, whatever that you can really do the work from home pretty easily, then it's going to be closer to maybe 70% It's going to be hybrid, one to three days in the office. And fully virtual employees is going to be a minority, 10 to 30%. Now, as part of that, you'll want to adopt best practices for virtual innovation and collaboration. And we'll talk about what that means. Now, I want to address the question that I hear asked a lot and that I've heard asked in a number of ways throughout this presentation about what leaders are doing and not doing. Should any employees really work fully virtually? And I've, you know, people have asked me that at the manufacturing company, at tech companies, at lots of research companies, biotech, pharma, so utilities. So this is a question I get asked often. And I'm gonna say, really, if you wanna seize a competitive advantage in the future of work, you definitely want to have some people working full-time remotely. You see top talent leaving. Apple, other companies like this that are, because they're being forced to return to the office. So you see top talent really leaving these companies. That's not great. Leaders really underestimate how much innovation, collaboration, and the, the capacity for true accountability there is in full-time virtual work. And they just aren't doing full-time virtual work, right? So this is a problem. And you want to address this. You want to address this with your leadership and tell them that, hey, you, this is not great. You want to fix this problem. And you want to make them aware that they are not doing full-time remote work right in a subtle way, but in a real way, not just letting them kind of get away with making these sorts of mistakes. So the full, who are the right people for fully remote options? So this is an important question that leaders always ask of me, who are the right people? Who should be that minority, the 10 to 30% who are fully remote? One is, if the team leader, people manager, decides that their team is fully remote, that's perfect. So that everyone on that team just decides they go fully remote, that's cool. Everyone there is going to be fully remote. That, that's one dynamic. That's one scenario in which that works very well. Then the second one that's going to be a little bit more tricky, it's individuals where the team leader decides everyone is going to come back to the office, let's say, you know, one day a week. But the individual on that team wants to be fully remote. I recommend in most cases that that individual is allowed to be fully remote if they are productive, if they're disciplined, and if they're self-starters when working remotely. So during these 18 months throughout the pandemic, if they showed themselves to be equally productive at least to pre-pandemic, and usually they'll be more productive, 
if they show themselves to be disciplined in their engagement with others, answers to questions and so on. Also, if they don't overwork, if they don't kind of burn themselves out, there are many people who tend to overwork when they're doing full-time remote and that's a problem. And so people can be trained to not do this, but that's, that's a problem. So they need to have discipline and work-life boundaries. And they need to be self-starters. They need to be able to take initiative. This is something that's important. This is part being able to take initiative. You need to address career growth issues. You need to be make sure that you're an effective self-advocate within the organization. Because if you're not, you'll kind of be more likely to be ignored when you're working full-time remotely than if you are in a hybrid team than if you're coming into the office. So you certainly can work full-time remotely, but you need to be an effective self-advocate for yourself to make sure that you get ahead in your career. In any case, if you're working full-time remotely, there should absolutely be team building retreats for full-time teams, as well as for, of course, for hybrid teams once a quarter, which improves social bonds and trust and helps plan team strategy. All right. I'll be happy to take any questions on these aspects of remote work strategy. So Tatiana asks, what options do you see being offered to frontline employees of who simply cannot work remotely, how to keep the balance between corporate and retail worlds. So this, of course, is the same sort of question that I, I got at the manufacturing company a lot. I'll talk about that closer to the end of the presentation, a little bit more in depth into that topic. But the answer that I'll give you right now is that you want to give people who are in retail or otherwise essential employees, let's say, I mean, for, for people who have to be in the workplace, manufacturing, in retail, healthcare, you want to give them more flexibility. So you want to give them flexibility as part of their work. And that's kind of going to be one aspect of benefits. That's one benefit. Another thing you want to make sure is to address cultural issues. So there is not a perception of haves versus have nots and that there's that disparity between corporate and retail and focus on making sure that the, that the emphasis is on outcomes, measuring outcomes. If in order to achieve your outcomes, your deliverables, you have to be in the office, of course you have to be in the office, it's not a question, you know, or on the retail floor. But if you don't have to be in the office, you know, do you really want your colleagues to just come to the office and go for the commute out of spite? What do you just want them to suffer like you suffered? Is this like hazing or something? You don't, you want to make that awareness part of your culture. You know, this is not hazing. You don't want your colleagues to suffer. You don't want them to waste their time on the commute. They can accomplish their outcomes from home, great, as long as they can accomplish their outcomes. Wherever they can accomplish their outcomes from, that's where they need to be. Whether it's home, whether it's a team building retreat, whatever it is, well, if they do a, a co-working site with another colleague, whatever they do, they need to focus on outcomes. So this is what it's about. What are the best team build, build what's the best team building for hybrid teams? Okay, we'll talk about that in the team collaboration section, which is coming up pretty soon. So thank you for asking that, Kim. Other questions? All right, so I'll assume that no more questions on this stage. Let's talk about the next topic. Now, how do you make the decisions on going back to the office? So the people managers, and that's the term I'm referring to, some people call them supervisors, people managers, team leads, whatever, the leading the six to eight people team. You need, before they make the decision, you need to educate them on this topic. You need to educate them on cognitive biases. So you need to train them on this topic. On what are the cognitive biases on the future of work? And we talked about them the normalcy bias, functional fixedness, status quo bias, 
false confirmation for I'm sorry, confirmation bias and the false consent effect. They need to be made aware of these and they need to check whether they're suffering from it. And the assessment can be helpful for this and other biases. So you need to be aware, they need to be aware of this before they make a decision on how they're coming back to the office because they don't, you don't want to just go to the office just because they feel it's the right thing to do. And then they also need to be trained on and experience, have some practice with best practices for virtual innovation, for virtual collaboration. And that was a question that was just asked that we'll get to by, um, by Kim, the best practices for building hybrid teams. So that's a question that they need to be trained on before they decide to hum, what their timing is, how they'll go back to the office. That's important because otherwise they'll be following their intuitions and making bad decisions. You don't want that to happen. So as part of giving them guidelines, you also need to give them training on these topics and resources on these topics. Then there needs to be the top level guidance that the amount of hybrid work the in-office work, how much pe time people spend in the office should be based on collaboration because your individual tasks are way better done at home. Your individual tasks, all the research suggests that for the large majority of people, the tasks that you work on individually are much better done at home. So if, you're, if your tasks are largely individual, that's uh, fine for you to just be you know, at home all the time. And if your uh, collaborative tasks aren't more intense. Now, for people who do need to do some collaboration, and if you want to go back to the office, if you have a desire, which many people do, if you want to maintain that team culture, for the large majority of people, one day a week is fine. So one day in the office per week is fine. That works well. You know, the amount of collaborative work that any employee does is usually less than 20%. Usually the large majority of their work is their individual activity. It's not something they have to meet with somebody else and actually work more intensely with somebody else to do. So one day a week is fine. And I see mostly people coming in for a team meeting that's going to last so a typical day for a hybrid team. What does that look like? And that's for companies that I help transition back to the office for who are already having those hybrid teams. Well, what they do is they come back, they come to the office, they choose a day, you know, I don't know, Tuesday for the team. So this is a team, the team meeting day. And uh, they come back to the off, they come to the office on Tuesday and they have a meeting in the morning, team meeting where it's kind of like one to two hour meeting and they discuss things. Then they break off into smaller subgroups where they you have to work with somebody else on various things. And maybe they have another team meeting. Maybe if you're part of two teams uh, and, and sometimes auditors are on more than one team where there's one, one primary team and there's kind of secondary cross-functional teams, then maybe there's another day where that team is meeting that you come back to the office. Ideally, it would be Tuesday, but you know maybe it's a Thursday. But let's say Tuesday. So what's happening there? Then that team that you're meeting for, you're collaborating with somebody else for you know maybe another hour or two. And then you just are free to do what you want. Nobody is forcing you to stay in the office that day. So that you can go back home if you want, or you can stay in the office and do your individual work in the office. Most people prefer to do their individual work at home. So they just go home and they do their individual work there. And then let's say you're part of another team that meets on a Thursday. So then that team, you come, you have the team meeting on a Thursday, maybe you do some work collaboration with somebody, a couple of people from that team. And then again, you go home. That's kind of a typical schedule for a hybrid uh, team. Most people are part of, typically people are part of one team, so they just come to the office one day a week. If you're part of more teams, you might come to the office more than once. Your default, that's good enough for team cohesion, for collaboration, for cultural engagement. And you want to make that the default and to have people managers justify any more time for their team, the one that they manage to go to the office. Why is that? because otherwise they'll still fall into these cognitive biases. You can't, I mean, a single trainings are not necessarily going to be enough for all the managers to get rid of these cognitive biases and kind of address their intuitions. Many will still want to go back to the office two, three, four, five days a week. So you need to make these people managers justify 
any additional time they force their team members to be in the office based on the amount of collaboration they have to do. So you need to justify them. And this needs to be part of the official process for determining how much, if you're kind of, you have the default, nobody's gonna ask any questions. If you have them come back to the office for your team, you know, just one day. If you want them to come back for more than one day, you need to justify that as part of your system, as part of the process for coming back to the office, that needs to be justified. And that's kind of a report to your supervisor, you know, the HR, whatever. Then there are a number of ways of justifying that, but you have to justify that. Otherwise, it should kind of defaults back to the previous ways of doing things, and that's no good for anyone. Happy to take questions on training people managers. Please go ahead. All right, if no question, let's go ahead and talk about reshaping office space. So office space prior to the pandemic was overwhelmingly individual. It's maybe 20% of it was collaborative and 80% of it was private office space. So you don't want that post pandemic, you want to make that mostly collaborative. So the first step would be to get information from team members and their plans for in office work. That's the first step. You want to know what they're coming in, uh, days that they're coming in. And then you also want to push them to make sure that their days don't overlap. You don't want everyone to come back on Tuesday or on Friday or Monday, because otherwise you get wastage of your office space that you uh, is going to be standing free the, the rest of the time. You're not going to use your resources efficiently. So you want to encourage teams, team leaders to not have their come, not to not have everyone come back on the same day that's going to be important. So have them push around those days, you know, and, and that's easy to do. Team leads would say, okay, this is the one day, this is my rank of days for which days I prefer everyone to come back or I have no preference for which days of the week people come back and then you manage that. That's an easy way, that's an easy solution. And then you want to declare your real estate and office services accordingly, and you change your office space to be mostly collaborative. So that's how you reshape your office space. You want your office space to be mostly collaborative. So it should change to something like one third private office space to two thirds collaborative. And by collaborative space, I mean spaces like video conference rooms. So video conference enabled conference rooms. So conference rooms that are good for team meetings and larger sort of events that are comfortable and have good video technology because on high, even on hybrid teams, you'll have some people who are working full-time remotely, so they'll need to video stream in and you don't want those to be awkward or problematic. So you want good video conferencing ability in your conference rooms. Then you want to have smaller boardrooms and smaller boardrooms for subgroups of teams where a couple of people need to meet in order to collaborate more intensely. And then you want more informal collaboration spaces like lounges where people can hang out and have conversations, sort of serendipitous idea generation spaces. So that's the kind of, and of course, you know, cafeterias, whatever. But that's the main changes you want to make. And that should be two thirds. Of course, you want also training spaces for various trainings and large event spaces. And that should be the two thirds of your space. One third should be office space that's private. And that means mostly leadership offices where you need to have a closed door in order to have private conversations. And the rest should be, some percentage should be maybe 10% of your office space should be floating desks, where desks, shared desk space, where people can get a desk if they want to do their, some of their individual work there. But they, you will not need an individual desk for overwhelmingly. You will not need an individual cubicle or an open desk or whatever. This is going to be shared desks because, of course, you'll do the vast majority of your work at home. So vast majority of your work at home, if you want to work um, at, in the office, you can bring your laptop into work and just plug it in, whatever is appropriate. 
and there should can be some computers there that anyone can use as well. So that is going to be the future of work. And that is great because it allows you to decrease your real estate footprint and office services. So there was one of the questions was asked earlier about, well, to what extent do leaders want people to go to the office because they want to use their existing real estate? That's kind of really, um, how do I say this? If you want your people to go to the office because you want to use your real estate, you're really thinking about things wrong. You're not thinking, I mean, what's the point of doing that? You want to use your real estate? No, you want to let go of your real estate. Look if it's profitable for you to break the lease. It probably is if you're not going to be using that. But even if you want to maintain the lease, whatever, no, don't do that. Don't force your people to come back to the office just to use up your real estate. What kind of thinking is that? You're not thinking about correctly about the usage of what the business outcome is. The business outcome is productivity, morale, engagement, recruitment, well-being, reduce stress, work-life balance. That is the goal for your people resources, not usage of real estate. Usage of real estate should be decreased. So if you're going to, let's say you're an average coming in, your team members are an average coming in one day a week. That means that you know some coming are full-time remote, some are coming in maybe two days a week because they have cross-functional teams or need to do more collaboration or three days a week. And then the, on average, people are coming in one day a week. That means compared to the pandemic, you have 20% office occupancy. 20% office occupancy, that, that's great. You can get rid of most of your office space. You can, in that sort of situation, companies get rid of something like 50 to 55% of their office space because they need something like 20% of their office space for leadership space, uh, for leadership offices, for payroll, accounting sort of stuff, for trainings, for large event space. And the rest of it is just going to be based on occupancy. So those collaborative spaces, mostly a little bit of those floating desks, that's going to be the remaining office space that you need. So you can get rid of the large majority of your office space. So that's really nice. And a real saver of costs. And that's something that leaders really appreciate. Happy to take questions on this topic. Reshaping office space. Okay, so I see a question came in about hoteling. So hoteling for companies. And for those who don't know uh, that you know, hoteling is basically where an employee reserves a desk that they want to use. And that's one option of floating, of shared desks, floating desks, I think it's fine. And there are a number of companies that use that, uh, that are actually facilitate that. So that's, you don't simply want to use Excel. If you're especially a mid-sized company, larger company, there are companies that provide apps for that, for arranging and collaborating effectively. I think that's, yeah, that's, that, that's definitely a good option and that works well for hybrid space, but it's, it's just one option. Another option is simply to have the, to bring your laptop and just have shared space. Hoteling works well for when you want to, I find it works better for reserving collaborative spaces for teams to meet. So if you have, you know, if you want to come back and come in on a Tuesday, you want to reserve a team room, that's that. And then you want to reserve for a subgroup, a boardroom to meet and to do some planning together for free people. That's a good, that's more useful, I find, for hoteling. Okay, Jessica asks about training new associates remotely. We'll talk about the training and getting them on board through in virtual collaboration. Uh, so this is gonna come up. So thank you for asking that question. 
what's the ideal office space configuration for hybrid work? So the ideal office space configuration, I think I mentioned is gonna be one third private and two thirds collaborative with those conference rooms, video, con video conference enabled conference rooms, the, those lounges for informal collaboration and boardrooms. So that's going to be the ideal configuration and the rest, I mean, you'll have some training spaces, you have, you'll have some large event spaces. Other questions? Susan asks about client interaction. Yeah, so client interaction, it depends on the clients. You want to definitely serve your clients well. Clients, I'm increasingly finding, are preferring virtual interactions. And it's often going to be the salesperson who, or the customer service manager who wants to meet with the client face-to-face. -face. Clients increasingly show a preference for virtual interaction. They increasingly don't want to meet face-to-face. -face. So that's perfect for working at home. That's totally fine. Now, if the client prefers to be have an in-person meetings, of course, you want to serve the client's needs. So in that case, you want to come back to the office. But you don't want to assume or impose on the client a need to meet in office. I've, uh, I was surprised. I was working with one insurance company, and they were pushing clients to meet face-to-face -face when they really didn't need to meet face-to-face. -face. And uh, when we did some client surveys and pollings of this topic, we found that clients were uh, not happy about the insurance agents and service, you know, customer service managers trying to get them to meet face-to-face -face when they didn't want to meet face-to-face. -face. And so we shifted that dynamic to not make the default meetings for those insurance agents for customers to meet face-to-face. -face. We made it so that the first question about client meeting was, how would you prefer to meet? Would you prefer to meet in person? Would you prefer to meet you know, virtually? What works best for you? And then let the client lead. Oh, perfect. Uh, Doris asked about a question about funding from home office funding. I'll talk about that next. So that's going to be the next question. Thank you for asking that. Good lead in. All right. I'll ask, I'll wait for five more seconds for seeing if there are any more questions about reshaping office space itself. Don't see anything coming in. So let's talk about that funding for home offices. So perfect lead into the next question. So companies should definitely fund home offices. The real use real estate organizations of all sorts should use real estate savings to fund home offices. So you'll be saving a lot of costs on the real estate, both the lease and then office-based services like security, janitor, real services, cleaning, and so on. And then you'll also be saving on office-based commercial products, everything from you know, pens and inks to printers, which you won't, commercial printers, which you won't need to buy. And you want to use that to help your employees have a comfortable home environment because now, you know, you're spending previously a couple of thousand per employee on in-office budget space. You need to redirect that space and use savings, which are getting quite a lot of savings to help them have a comfortable home office environment because that's going to increase their productivity, increase their well-being, decrease stress, increase engagement and morale, the same reasons you're spending on them in the office. You want to have a good internet connection. I'm still surprised by how many people have a base internet connection, the lowest, cheapest from their, insure, from their internet connection, when they can greatly benefit from their collaboration with others from a higher internet, from better internet connection. And that's something that employees generally will not pay for themselves. And you don't want to make them pay for themselves because that's not fair, not appropriate. 
So you want to make sure as a company to pay for their internet connection. You want to pay for their equipment. And by equipment, I don't only mean laptops, which of course companies should be providing and many are already providing as a baseline laptop. Of, so monitors and so on that make it more comfortable for their employees to work. But I also mean things like a nice video camera, a nice microphone, nice headset and lighting. Remember, microphones, headsets, video cameras, they are not important for the employee herself or himself. They're not important for the employee. They're important for their team members. They're important for the clients with whom they're conversing and interacting. They're important for their ability to communicate effectively. And employees are not going to be bothered by these things. They're mostly not going to be getting the high quality things that you as a company need your employees to have in order to collaborate effectively and productively. So you want to make sure to address that and get them good equipment. Ergonomic furniture. You know, employees, this is the future of work. You're investing, you know, so many leaders did not fund. Only 25% of companies funded their employees during the pandemic for a comfortable home office. But this is the future of work. If you have your employees working hybrid, let's say on average, all of your employees are working one day a week, meaning 10 to 30% are working full-time remotely. You know, another 10 to 30% are coming in two days a week on average, or maybe a little bit more. So you have an average everyone working one day a week. That means that 80% of the work for your company is getting done in employee home offices. That's now your home office. That is part of your company. That is part of your organization. And you need to make sure that employees are comfortable in it so that they're productive in it. Soundproofing, same thing. If people are disrupted, if they have loud noises, they're not going to be working effectively room separators, all of these sorts of things. You don't want their kids to be running into the room and disrupting them. So you want to make sure that they don't have a separate home office to have a room separator. That's really important. In terms of funding, the amount of funding, the amount of funding on average should be two to 3,000, depending on cost of living, with an additional 500 toward working parents to take care of child-related needs for you know, working from home. So that's the typical amount of funding that people should be getting for their home offices. And this doesn't matter if you're working full-time remotely or working hybrid, you're still, even if you're working hybrid, you're still spending 80% of your time working from your home office. Now I want to ask a question about this. Do you think you and any members of your team might benefit from such funding to establish a quite uncomfortable office space and acquire good quality technology equipment and broadband access. Please go ahead and vote. See, we have about 80% of the people participated. Make sure to make your voice heard and also make sure this will fa facilitate you getting the continuing credit education from IIA. So I'll give you five more seconds if you haven't voted yet. Great. Okay, so overwhelmingly, this is, seems a very important thing to do. Now, 95% of you perceive this to be important, valuable to get this home funding. So I'm glad to hear that. And that's something definitely to share with your employee here, if you perceive that. And knowing that 95% of fellow auditors perceive that, that's an important data point to help advocate for getting such funding. And of course, my book talks about that as well. So that'll be helpful. Yes, I'll be happy to take questions about funding for home offices. Okay. Tara said there wasn't an option to say we had the option to be provided that type of equipment. Yeah, I mean, that was going to, that, that's something that would be helpful. So that would be a yes. Other questions relating to funding for home offices?
All right. So this, you know, whether your equipment from home, I mean, if the company is providing you, of course not. If the company, I'm not sure about the IRS regulations, if you can deduct those expenses. I'm not sure if you can deduct them if you're not self-employed. So I would be cautious about deducting expenses that are that you spend if you're not self-employed. So this is something that really the company should be getting for you. This is not something you should be getting for yourself. So Susan says, providing laptops, but not other home provisions. And she doesn't see that happening with her firm. I'm sorry to hear that. This is something that's really important for employees for productivity. So the productivity, the firm is just shooting itself in the foot if it's not doing that. If it's not providing your employees with good laptop, with good cameras, microphones, and uh, lighting, headphones, then they're not collaborating effectively. And they're not collaborating effectively, then they're going to be harming the company as a whole if they're not doing that. Same thing for ergonomic furniture. If your employees are not comfortable, they're not as productive as they can be. Soundproofing, room separators, same sort of things. This is a, basically about collaboration, productivity, comfort, engagement. And if you don't do that, then you're just harming your bottom line. This is the simple fact. And you can you know, go back and tell them that I said this. This is just the case. It's not wise to not provide this. So Kelsey says that this is a little unfair that people who are not getting funding due to lack of planning. Uh, unfair is only one aspect of it. Um, harmful for the company's bottom line, I think, is problematic from the perspective of productivity and engagement, retention, recruitment, morale. You know, this is a problem. This is a problem for the company that from their productivity and engagement aspect. So this is something to definitely address. And Susan says they're waiting to address the unused real estate. I mean, in the meantime, they're hurting themselves by not getting this done. So this is just a question of, you know, why do you care about the question of real estate? I understand costs, but you're really hurting yourself by not doing these things for the employees. All right. Don't see any more questions coming in. So let's talk a little bit about innovation. So I want to address innovation because this is something that often arises where leaders say, well, we want to go back to the office because we can't innovate effectively. And that's a real problem. What they're doing for deliberate innovation, the way that innovation overwhelmingly happens, deliberate innovation when you have a specific topic you want to innovate on, you have novel ideas, is brainstorming. Brainstorming is the traditional thing where everyone gathers in a room and you talk about a topic, you generate ideas, and then out of the box ideas, novel ideas, then you stop that, then you have an evaluation process, you evaluate the ideas, and then you bring out the best ones and you implement. It. And that has definitely a lot of benefits. That's the traditional brainstorming, but it does not work very well in a virtual format. That traditional brainstorming just doesn't work very well. No, when you're collaborate, trying to collaborate virtually, you get less ideas, less innovation. But that's because you are trying to imply in-office culture on a different format. That's not the format that you should be using. You should be using virtual, uh, intentional, asynchronous brainstorming. And that can be used virtually, hybrid, or fully in-person teams. And it has a number of benefits over traditional brainstorming, actually, this asynchronous, intentional, digital brainstorming, which you're doing digitally, not in person, not uh, with each other synchronously at the same time. So you're doing it separately at different times. Now, that takes care of a number of issues with traditional brainstorming. And I'll list those issues just so you know what those are. When you look at the research on traditional brainstorming, there are some inhibitors to idea creation. One of them is called production blocking. Production blocking. That's when you have an idea, but other people in the room are talking about a different idea as part of the initial brainstorming. 
and you're reluctant to interrupt them and the conversation gets away from you and you forget your idea and kind of you don't have an opportunity to introduce it. That generally happens to people who tend to be a more introverted, who are less excited about interrupting others when they're talking. Also for people who are more introverted, they have more trouble thinking in a louder environment where other people are speaking. So they have more trouble, they think better on their own in that individualized setting. So it's a problem for introverts in two ways. And then it's a problem, this production blocking is also a problem for lower status people in the team who also have trouble interrupting, who also have reluctance to interrupt. So that's production blocking. Another problem is called evaluation apprehension. And that's, a little, that's where you're worried about sharing an idea because it seems a little bit crazy, a little bit novel, a little bit out of the box. You're afraid of what other people will think. And the other aspect of evaluation apprehension is in the evaluation stage where you're worried about what criticizing the ideas of other people because they will be upset at you. So that's evaluation apprehension. And there are other problems which the book talks about, but these are the two biggest ones. Evaluation apprehension is especially a problem for people who are more pessimistic, so whose personalities tend to predispose them to see more dangers, more threats. And internal auditors, by the way, from looking at statistics tend to be more pessimistic than others. And it's also a problem, again, for lower status people who are afraid of judgments. So instead of that, you can do vert digital asynchronous brainstorming, intentional brainstorming. Here's how you do it. First, everyone develops ideas independently. So separately from each other, you develop your ideas, you generate them separately, and then you all input them into the same spreadsheet anonymously. So there's no, no, there's no way that you know, you know whose idea it is so that you're worried about criticizing it. And there's no way that you, know, you need to be worried about sharing a crazy out of the, blo you know, out of the box idea because no one knows that you're the one who shared it. So a good way of doing this for the technique is simply a Google form that spits out a spreadsheet with all the ideas. So everyone, Google form is anonymous, everyone enters their ideas and that's your share your ideas anonymously. That's great. Then, so that addresses evaluation apprehension and production blocking, much better for optimists, I'm sorry, much better for pessimists, much better for introverts. So it addresses that cognitive diversity aspect that is heard by traditional brainstorming. So it's kind of an institutional form of collaboration that goes against diversity, this traditional brainstorming, goes against cognitive diversity. And this intentional brainstorming that's asynchronous and uses digital forms helps cognitive diversity. So that's another benefit of it. Then I, either you have a facilitator who facilitates it, and I've facilitated a number of these brainstorming sessions, or the participants themselves clean up the ideas. Clean up meaning simply remove duplicates, remove slash combine duplicates, and categorize the ideas into appropriate categories. Next, again, this is anonymous. Everyone comments on and rates the quality of the, of the idea shared. So you comment on the idea, so you go for each idea on the spreadsheet that's left after the removal of duplicates and categorization, and you comment on what you think of the idea, and then you rate it based on how good it is in its novelty and how practical it is in its application. So you rate each idea on those two criteria, at least you can also rate another criteria, depending on the specific needs of the innovation, but those two, the criteria that are really important. Then you see, you look for the ratings, you see your ideas, you see others, and you generate another set of ideas, again, all anonymously. So all develop and share a revised set of ideas. And then again, you have cleanup. That seventh step is the cleanup of these ideas, the revised ideas. And then all comment on and rate the quality of the revised ideas shared. Again, anonymous call commenting. So you address the evaluation apprehension and you address that. Then you have synchronous meeting. So this is finally where you have a synchronous meeting and it's fine to have it virtually. For hybrid teams, I recommend having it in person, but it's fine to have this virtually. It works much, much better than the, than the brainstorming meeting because you're not creating ideas. You're simply looking at the, this is essentially a, 
planning meeting because you already kind of evaluated it. So you're looking at the ideas that are already evaluated and commented on. You don't even have to evaluate them. You just see, okay, this is what people generally think. Which of these ideas that are already evaluated and commented on and rated should we see as the best combination of novelty and practicality for us to go ahead and implement them? And then you decide on the next steps. So like I said, it's even in person. You can do this for a fully in-person team for all essential workers, I recommend doing this because it's better for introverts and pessimists. And we know that this results in much more innovative outcomes. Even if you do this process fully in person, it results in much more innovative outcomes. Absolutely, there's extensive statistics showing this, studies showing this, that it results in innovative outcomes based both on the innovation of the ideas and the practicality of the ideas that result from this process. So the number of innovative and practical ideas definitely are more than traditional brainstorming. It works even better. So this is a really useful technique for innovative innovation for hybrid and virtual teams. And this addresses part of the question of that was asked before about collaborating for hybrid teams. And I'll talk about many more aspects of collaboration. But I want to see first, whether you think such virtual brainstorming might be valuable for your workplace. So please go ahead and vote. I see that 84% of you participated. I'll give you five more seconds. Make sure to make your voice heard. Go ahead, five more seconds. All right, so this seems to be quite, quite popular. This technique would be beneficial for 90% of you. So really quite popular technique, that's great. It's gonna be in the book that you should have gotten already and you can, I'll send you more information about it later on a white paper specifically on virtual brainstorming. Great, I'll be happy to take questions on virtual brainstorming now. Okay, no questions that I see. Let's talk about another aspect of brainstorming, which is serendipitous idea generation. So serendipitous idea generation this is another kind of issue that leaders often tell me that this is why I want my staff to go back to the office Monday through Friday, nine to five, because so much of our ideas, you know, one third to one half of our greatest ideas sprang from initially hallway conversations after meetings or when people just run into each other and chat this, and they generate these ideas serendipitously. And that of course happens much, much, much less in virtual formats because you don't have those, you know, the staff meetings or Zoom happy hours. That's one of the reasons that managers are not very happy with them and they want to go back to the office because they don't get that serendipitous idea generation. That's a problem. Now, when I ask them what they try to do instead, they don't they tell me that they did the Zoom happy hours and the staff meetings and hope that people will talk about it afterward uh, with each other afterward, which of course never happens. That is not good. There's research based on best practices and what you do instead. So what you need to do is create a channel in your collaborative software for this topic. Let's say you have Microsoft Teams or you have Slack or Trello or Mondays or something like that. On each of those formats, on Trello, you can have a card for a team. On Microsoft Teams, you can have a channel, same thing on Slack for each team. So this is a six to eight people team. You wanna do that for each team. You have a separate channel for serendipitous ideas for cross-functional teams. So if you have a cross-functional team, you have to do that 
and for a larger business unit, whether it's a department, division, whatever. If it's a smaller organization, that would be the whole company. So yeah, like under a hundred or something, or a couple of hundred can be for a whole company, just a channel for serendipitous ideas. So spontaneous, I'm sorry, spontaneous ideas. So, so when you have an idea, anyone has an idea relevant to the team, your own team, your cross-functional team, business unit, you just put that in there. You post it in the appropriate channel. You have like, oh, I have an idea. What about this? I have an idea. What about that? Others respond if they find the idea useful. And you'll often tend to see that the optimists are the ones who generate the ideas and the more pessimistic people are the ones who tend to improve the ideas, which again, more auditors tend to be pessimistic far from all, but that's just the baseline statistics. You know, people love to give advice, you know how that is. And then you kind of snowball. And uh, if the response is from other snowball until there's a critical mass, you go back and do intentional asynchronous brainstorming as a technique. So that's a really good technique for innovating from anywhere. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this idea, whether this serendipitous idea generation in virtual formats might be valuable for your workplace. Please go ahead and vote. See, just about just under eighty percent of you participated. So I'll give you five more seconds. Five more seconds. Make your voice heard. And this seems to be also very popular. Eighty-seven percent of you. So over eighty-five percent of you would want this that, that might be valuable for your workplace. And the thing is, both of these brainstorming, virtual brain, intentional asynchronous brainstorming, this virtual brainstorming, very easy to insert it for any team. You know, your team of internal auditors, you can bring this to your the team and just institute this tomorrow. And it's even easier to institute the serendipitous, uh, the spontaneous idea generation this in virtual formats. You just get a team and you set that channel and you have that communicate to everyone that, hey, here's this thing, put your ideas in, others comment and, and so on. It's very easy to bring. These are very easy fixes to insurmountable problems that managers tell me these are insurmountable problems. And they definitely work. They're highly effective in companies that institute this. They really find that these are very good techniques and they get a lot of bang for their buck. I'll be happy to take questions on either virtual innovation or any other topics that I've talked about so far, and then we'll take a break. So Susan says that we do small things and try to do goofy networking activities. It's not really beneficial. I'd like to be more productive and related to my work. Absolutely, yeah. This is not a useful activity. This is kind of another version of social, another version of uh, happy Zoom happy hours. That, that is not a beneficial activity. We'll talk about ways of doing collaboration more effectively that get your team spirit uh, that are adapted to virtual formats in the next section. But uh, virtual brainstorming is definitely something useful. You want to not try to do people, have them interact with each other just for the sake of interaction. It's not helpful. All right, doesn't seem like there are any questions. Let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back at 1.25. So 10 minute break, come back at 1.25. Go ahead.
Okay, we'll give folks another minute and then we'll restart. All right, so let's go on, let's restart and let's talk about collaboration. So we talked about innovation specifically and it's a matter of collaboration. Let's talk about more broadly collaboration. One of the questions was this, how do you collaborate effectively with your team? How do you make sure to have team spirit? People try goofy networking things, people try team meetings, That that is not good. What you want to do instead is best practices that are actually adapted to the virtual environment. So here's a best practice that works much better for virtual environments for maintaining team spirit, collaborating with each other, and also getting new team members engaged, involved, and helping them learn on the job. One of the biggest losses and a re major reason that managers tell me they want people to go back to the office is loss of on-the-job learning. Well, here's a way that you can get on-the-job learning, which is, lots of on-the-job learning is about being able to quickly, immediately ask someone about a topic and then being able to show you the response, show you, answer you mostly verbally and sometimes show you. So this is how it works. What you want to do is each day, this is for hybrid teams as well as fully virtual teams, for, so hybrid teams, the days that you're not in the office. So that's the days that you're not in the office. You know, if your day in the office is Tuesday, it's gonna be all the other four days of the week and fully virtual team all five days of the week. What you do is you essentially work along your team members on a video conference call on your own top, on your own project, not on a shared project. This is not about collaboration. You work on your own project. Here's how it works. So it's going to be an hour or two per day, depending on the team, but at least an hour um, for each team. So as you try it out, I recommend you start with an hour. If it works well, you can increase it to two hours, three hours. But generally, I recommend doing it for an hour to start with. You all get into a video conference call. So shared video conference call, Microsoft Teams, whatever. Get into a video conference call and you... What you do is you turn your microphone off and you start, well, you don't turn your microphone off yet. You have everyone on, you have uh, videos on, you have microphones on, you have your speakers on, and you start by sharing what you want to work on. So what's the project in which you'll want to do the work? The most team members save a project that's more complex for this, for this activity or a project on which they don't know as much, on a project on which team members might know more, so or a project that might touch on some other team members' competencies. Then you turn off your microphones. You turn them off, you leave your speakers on, and your video is optional. You want to leave it on, you leave it on. You don't want to leave it on, you don't leave it on. Then you just work. You work on your individual project. You don't do, you, do, you don't collaborate again. It's not about collaboration. But as you have questions or you have innovation ideas, you know, spontaneous ideas come to you, you turn on your microphone and you share it. And then your team members can answer questions and discuss the ideas. 
if they need if you need to be shown something you can do a screen share and you, they show this topic to you or they can do it on, from their own computer screen share whatever so works really well then you discuss those ideas this is great so you end by turning on your microphones and sharing what you accomplished during this part and you get off it helps team members really bond it's this is super helpful for the team collaboration managers are really worried about the team spirit how's that going to work this is very helpful for team bonding it facilitates innovation because you have those innovative ideas so that's also beneficial and it helps integrate junior team members because they get learning on the job they get to be part of the team they get to ask questions so it helps them be part of the team now I want to ask you in a poll whether digital co-working would be valuable for your workplace. So please go ahead and vote on the poll of whether digital co-working would be valuable for your workplace. So, Tim has issues with words on the screen looking fuzzy and hard to read. You know, for me, they appear fine and they appeared fine before. So I suspect it might be maybe a computer focus issue and hopefully on your end. Oh, fuzzy for me too. Hmm, not sure why. Try going in and out of the meetings and seeing if that will help. Yeah, don't know about why it might be. Hmm was clear earlier this morning. That's strange. Let me try on my end. I can disconnect and connect my screen and see if that helps. Oh, um, yeah, five more seconds for the poll. So if you didn't answer it yet. Let's see if that helps. All right. So hopefully this helps. So Susan, not sure why I didn't see the poll, oh, but yeah, it's there. So then send your poll answer to um, IIA Kansas City chapter so that they count for you. Weird, I don't know why they're still fuzzy. Hopefully next screen will be better. Well, if there's fuzzy for you, you might try getting out of the meeting and uh, getting back in because I was, yeah, this connected automatically. So hmm. not just the words. All right, you know what? I'll try to, uh, Philip, let me try to go in and out of the meeting. So just make sure that uh, you let me back in. All right. Got it. And I'll try that. If that doesn't work, we'll just have to go with it. <laughs> yep.